When one thinks of the mightiest war machines of the clans, the first thing that comes to mind are the deadly Omnimex that were the sharpened tip of their spear during the 3050s that were used to plunge into the inner sphere at the onset of the clan invasion. Infamous battle mechs like the Timberwolf, Summoner, and Mad Dog are the face of these vicious machines and Operation Revival, a clan term used for their invasion in 3049. These spectacularly advanced, almost alien creations were responsible for destroying countless defenders of the Inner Sphere when they first encountered them. They were nightmares as much as they were the bleeding edge of the clan's technologies in this era, and they were the emblem of the clan's prestige and glory. To the warriors that belong to these outsiders, the Omnimech represents the ultimate weapons, being far superior to anything else yet imagined by human minds for conquest. But what if this assumption by the clan's warrior cast was all built on falsehoods? Weapons of war in any industrial civilization or greater require a solid foundation of technology and development in order to achieve battlefield supremacy. This is without question, but there is more to fighting a conflict than the simple, romantic notions of war behind the clan's dueling system. Wars, much like the armored vehicles that take part in it, are won on a balancing number of factors, whether it be in the realms of the people, equipment, or strategies used when participating in them. In short, it is misguided to think that only the bleeding edge of technology wins conflicts. Frequently overpriced and too hard to support, the Omnimech is a trap for many clan warriors and the clans as a whole. This mech type, as a concept, has been greatly overvalued in the clan's quest to find supremacy above all of their adversaries, both internally and externally. To find the truth, to discover the most remarkably dangerous walking armored fighting vehicles of the descendants of the SLDF, one must look past these over-engineered relics of a new age and peer into the distant and near past of humanity. Prior to the exodus led by Alexander Kerensky out of the Inner Sphere, it is more than ironic that the clan most well known for using second-line mechs in a series of campaigns would be the one which was considered least clan-like during the age prior to the clan invasion, and it would be they that created a true champion, one that is amongst the greatest weapons forged by the entirety of the clans. These warriors and scientists didn't look towards the future when building this titanic destroyer, but looked towards arguably the most successful war machines in the history of the Inner Sphere. It was not hard for them to see the virtues of this king of war as it was a mech that was used by commanders, duelists, and frontline combatants of all skill levels. This was all just from their inspiration's storied history in the Star League and before that, the Terran hegemony. They looked towards their stellar example, this template for the future of warfare in clan space, and saw a mech that was never so overcomplicated by its configurations and construction for it to ever be truly hindered with repairs, maintenance, or limited logistical support. In the 29th century, Clan Star Adder would assemble one of the most effective for cost bipedal machines ever devised by the clans. In the Cauldron of Sheridan, a mech with an already legendary history would be reborn into an improved fighting form that would be more than a challenge for its future siblings of the Omnimech variety. In spite of this, for a time, falling out of favor, this incredible achievement of engineering would persist, much like its ancestor, 
and is now sought after by more than just clan pilots for its virtues. In this piece, we are going to examine the entire known history and properties of a battle mech that truly dominates war, even into the Ill Clan era. It is a hammer formed by the celestial scales of the Star Adder itself. The Warhammer 2C. Return to the Inner Sphere is impossible for us. Our heritage and our convictions are different from those we left behind. The greed of the Five Great Houses and the Council Lords is a disease that can only be burned away by the passing of decades, even centuries. And though the fighting may seem to slow, or even cease, it will erupt again as long as there are powerful men to covet one another's wealth. We shall live apart, conserving all the good of the Star League and ridding ourselves of the bed, so that when we return, and return we shall, our shining moral character will be as much our shield as our battle mechs and fighters. Commanding General Alexander Kerensky, General Order 137, the 5th of December, 2785. To fully understand what brought about the creation of the titular Warhammer 2C, one must understand the history of those who made it, as well as what inspired and motivated them. To do that, you must examine more specifically the individuals, beliefs, and doctrines that would come to craft it in their own ways. One side illuminates the other which illuminates the other. These are the conditions that created the leaders that saw value in refreshing and rebuilding the Warhammer into something truly terrifying, and who used it over the course of the centuries leading up to the clan invasion and Wars of Reaving, with a lethal level of skill and tactics. The Clans The last descendants of Alexander Kerensky's exodus, the last still impressive remnants of the then beleaguered Star League Defense Forces seemingly changed quite dramatically in their transition from the Inner Sphere into the Deep Periphery, both amongst the Pentagon Worlds and later the Kerensky Cluster, before this collectively traumatized society evolved into the techno-barbarians that were the clans though. They were people from the Inner Sphere in their truest forms. These individuals had backgrounds from the Terran Hegemony, Free Worlds League, Federated Sons, Leering Commonwealth, Draconis Combine, Capelling Confederation, and even the Periphery. Most set aside their differences to fight alongside one another to protect the dying Star League, with a few outsiders notably wanting to just simply stop the madman. Stefan Ameris. The president of the Rimworld's Republic had through a moment of treachery built on years of deception, functionally annihilated the main branch of House Cameron, and declared himself Emperor of the supposed Empire at the heart of human space. The campaign these men and women fought in, however, had become all-consuming. Eventually, fighting became all they ever knew. Following General Kerensky was a part of this experience. When the very same now former protector of the realm, General Alexander Kerensky, led them far away from the inner sphere in the aftermath, beyond anywhere mankind had explored before, towards distant lights and an uncertain, strained, even terrifying future, things began to fall apart. Long-term leadership was always going to be a test, especially with Alexander being so old when they departed. Worse still, his eldest son, Nicholas Kerensky, 
was already having an impact on the intellectual and philosophical ideologies of those who now fled the inner sphere, at least among some in the fleet. Because these people had been soldiers, warriors, and had fought earnestly for so long, their views of martial prowess and dignity were interwoven with one another very tightly. The poison that Nicholas was selling gradually worked its way through the minds of some of the most dutiful of officers, as their perceptions had been so badly skewed by the carnage and horror of what they'd participated in during the collapse of the Terran state, and from their fighting the Rimworld's army. These people now wanted a new life, and what would that new life mean for so many? Sir, what do we do? That is a question we have been asking ourselves for months now. And what is strange is that we always find ourselves right back at Nicholas's idea. Test them. It has its merits, there is no doubt about that. I tend to think he will be disappointed with how we put that theory into actual practice. But if the only person that has a problem with it is young Nikolas Kerensky, I think we will be in good shape. The fact that he saw more death and bloodshed before he became a man than most soldiers ever do was not good for the boy. He's come out of that hell on terror with a vision of the universe unlike anyone else I've ever seen. It's almost as he sees everyone who isn't a soldier as a nuisance. Perhaps that isn't the best word. Books might be more like it. In any event, we will begin the testing as soon as we can determine what the testing will consist of, which I have no doubt it would take less time than convincing the generals of it. General Aaron de Chavillier, Personal Diary, 13 of August 2787. The greater diaspora of the now former SLDF were experiencing more than a few problems as well. Factionalism spread through the units of this once grand army like a virus, as the new worlds they settled became increasingly split like the great houses they'd fled, and as General Kerensky had warned them against. People couldn't set aside themselves and their heritages. The war that now raged across the Inner Sphere, the First Succession War, echoed across the Pentagon colonies. Though in stages, before the entirety of the mess started to come undone. It was inevitable. It is absolutely impossible to erase centuries of cultural conflict without also eliminating those cultures totally and without remorse. We knew that we would eventually have to deal with this. Problem is, we let optimism blind us. Now, we have to act and hope that it is not too late. We must act decisively and with overwhelming force if we are to preserve what we have built here. And we must not allow compassion to obscure us from the path we must take. Now, I have to make Alex understand this. General Aaron de Chavillier, Personal Diary, 3rd of December, 2800. The infamous and disastrous de Chavier massacre took place in May of 2801, truly breaking this new realm, as well as mimicking every horrible attribute that de Chavier and Kerensky had hoped to escape. General de Chavier himself was killed in the opening of this new debacle, and there was no preventing a true war after this tragic incident. Kerensky tried to control the situation by brutally crushing the rebels within the colony of Cathay. With the full force of his authority and power, the old general ordered the destruction of the Separatists who had killed his best and longest friend. The man who was lost was the same friend that had helped him carry the burden of the dying Star League on his shoulders. But this act of discipline and vengeance did not quell the animosity across the Pentagon worlds. The violence only fed into more violence. This act by the General started a cycle that fed the flames of conflict and discord 
rather than quenching it. In other words, instead of saving this last beacon of the Star League, taking it beyond the greed and envy of mankind as he'd envisioned, Kerensky finished destroying it. All hell broke loose. And before the end of June 2801, Alexander Kerensky was dead. His son, Nicholas, much to the misery of the future generations of mankind, was set to be his successor. Alexander, in his final days, had appointed his heir apparent, finally recognizing his son, Nicholas, as the one to succeed him in guiding the people of the Star League. He did so after years of grief, loss, and disappointment caught up with him. Beyond this, truthfully, neo-feudalism was ingrained in the culture of mankind by this point as well, and there would always be expectations that leadership be inherited through lineage. There was only ever one choice, truthfully, for Alexander to pick that had the greatest chance of being accepted. And that was his eldest son, Nicholas. Even with his successor being his son, and having his support before his death, most of his divisional commanders had noticed Nicholas's flawed personality and mental attributes. They recognized him as a dangerous, sick man, with a vision for mankind that would strip it of all of its connections, and twist it into something new and appalling. This was the position of the overwhelming majority of the SLDF divisional commanders at the time. All but one. While often history has a tendency to focus its lens on supposed great men, almost all of them are built by supporters who are very often unaddressed. We told ourselves we were different from the rest. We convinced ourselves of that. And Kerensky and De Chevalier kept reminding us of that fact. But they were wrong. They were different, and without them, we no longer had our moral compass. A voice to our conscience. Without them, we reverted back to that which we were fighting. There was nothing but chaos. One would think that we wouldn't have that problem within a military organization, but we do. Every single division commander seems to have a different opinion, regardless of the staff. With just one death, one that frankly we all knew was coming sooner or later, we've given up a thousand years of advancement and become nothing more than a council of bitter generals and a petty hunter. Major General Absalom Truscott, Personal Journals, 25th June. 2801. History can often seem outlandish, or absurd at times, and this almost divine humor followed mankind well past its time on Earth, in the world of Battletech. The stars aligned for Nicholas Kerensky, because Major General Absalon Truscott the only divisional commander who stood for Nicholas Kerensky after the death of his father, had been a friend, confident, mentor, and ally of his since Nicholas's rescue on Terra in the final days of the Ameris Empire. Truscott had been an aide and bodyguard to Alexander throughout much of the campaign to stop Ameris during the height of the conflict, and this would extend past just knowing the great protector of the realm. After the liberation of Moscow on Terra, when Truscott had only been a major, he found himself being the one to help the young Nicholas Kerensky hone his skills as a mech warrior, taking him under his wing and guiding him into the world of battle mech combat. In the years that followed, he was considered the unofficial big brother of both of Kerensky's sons, helping advise them in many ways, as he'd advised their father. Only two years prior to Kerensky's death, Absalon would be granted command of the 149th Battle Mech Division, and Big Brother paid his respects to the heir apparent. Man he must have known was the way he was, and knew believed the extreme things he believed. His peers, 
the others who were once loyal to the general did not remain in lockstep, refusing to offer their pledges of allegiance to Nicholas as mentioned prior, and rejecting him despite Alexander's wishes. While this was in all likelihood the morally correct thing to do, as the son of the great leader was very probably a madman and a psychopath, it meant that chaos took over the now dying SLDF. Not only were separatists splintering it, the last of them were now divided within, as divisional commanders all supported their own bids to be leader of the defense forces. The army was finally fully broken. It achieved what the Rimworld's army could not. It defeated itself. Taking his new followers, with a handful of loyal regiments, as well as a host of civilians they rescued, Major General Nicholas Kerensky embarked on what he now called the Second Exodus, and fate ordained their landing on Stranomekdi not long after, otherwise known as the Land of Dreams. This was where he began to sculpt the broken and beaten people who had fled the Inner Sphere with his father. It is telling that when Nicholas stood down as the divisional commander of the 146th Royal Battlemech Division to serve as the leader of the new Star League in exile, he gave its command to General Truscott. Given the danger of that moment, that will tell you just how much General Nicholas Kerensky trusted him. Truscott took the 146th and merged it with the remnants of the 149th, forming the new 146th Division. This military force, the only full combat-tested battle mech division under the new Star League in Exile's leadership, was necessarily its muscle. And that strong arm now shielded, guarded, and enforced Nicholas's vision. It was led by the snake that was perhaps his true brother. Not by blood, but in spirit. The phrase on everyone's lips is how could this have happened again, when it is obvious that it couldn't have but happened. And if we aren't careful, we will face the very same problems yet again. Only this time, we won't have the luxury of escaping it. Nicholas addresses the fleet almost daily, expounding on his theories of what happened and his plans for the future. He's doing something his father didn't, selling his vision. And in the process, he's building a cult of personality around him. Perhaps that's not a bad thing. That may be precisely what we need. Nothing else has worked to this point. At least we know where we are going and what will happen when we get there. Strana Mekdi is every bit an ideal destination at least considering the other choices open to us. I fear Nicholas's methods are precisely what we need. Wyndham would say that the way before us is a strange path with many twists and turns. And he is right. Only we must choose for ourselves the correct path. Major General Absalom Truscott, Personal Journals, 19th April, 2802. It is time to set the past behind and move into a future that will allow us to rekindle the bright flame of the Star League's golden age. 800 warriors. They shall be my clans. 20 clans to represent the 20 colonized worlds of the Kerensky Cluster. The future belongs to all of us. We shall share in the bright dream that is to come. As we all work to a common future, we shall look forward, knowing we are ready and willing to do what we must to create a new society, 
to seize the day. Nicholas Kerensky, in his address to the Kerensky Cluster, 11th of June, 2807. The arrival on Stronomachne was difficult in its own way. The pre-existing colonists and their society needed to be cowed into submission by the cult of Kerensky's new Star League shortly after their arrival, but they presented problems. The grand successor to Alexander Kerensky, the man who would be venerated as nearly a god by the clans of later years, went about building and then enforcing his utopian vision for the world. Castes, the destruction of the family, the veneration of warriors above all others, and cutting away the weak by engaging with practices resembling social Darwinism, all quickly took shape under Nicholas. It would be the Iron Womb's invention that would change things most radically, however as he finally saw a way to disassociate his prized, perfect warriors from everything that had been created naturally. It was a cure not only for the population issues they faced, but for the handicap he viewed as holding humanity back. The last fragments of the bonds of family passed from mother to child. With time, the clans and their warriors would become genetically engineered killers. But first, Nicholas would choose only the most dangerous of his SLDF soldiers to become the base of his new disciples, the pioneers of his brave new world. After industries were laid down on Stronomachne and his new army was prepared, Nicholas Kerensky would unleash his wrath upon the Pentagon worlds, namely on those who had refused to accept his leadership and guidance. His Star League in exile would be born in conquest and blood. But who would these clans be? What would they be? He would forge 20 of them, and from amongst his greatest allies, he would choose their cons, the leaders of this social and military endeavor. His most important companion from the start was not his brother Andery, regardless of the propaganda one may believe about it. But it was his other brother, Absalom, and he would give him the reins of Clan Star Adder. From the very beginning, the Star Adders were not like the other clans. Not at all. Absalom was one of the first choices to be picked by Nicholas to serve as a Khan. It was a reward for loyalty and trust, but also, I suspect, to guarantee the support of his mentor and friend and one who he knew he could rely on more than any others. In fact, Nicholas showed such a fullness of trust and faith in his brother that unlike every other Khan, True Scott was able to choose for his clan every single one of the initial warriors that would occupy it. They were not selected by Kerensky or some other arbitrary means, such as who was left over. This meant that the Star Adders were True Scott's animal, completely, from the very beginning. He knew his entire purpose in forming this clan of Star Serpents would be to craft them into the embodiment of the military traditions of the SLDF. Unlike the other clans, who all from the very start began to focus significantly on personal honor and martial pride in their warriors and leadership, True Scott would pragmatically select as his Sarkon, Master Sergeant Devon Lefaber, a man that was mostly renowned for his understanding of staff and logistics, than his abilities as a direct combatant. This choice was treated as being so outrageous by the other dedicated followers of Kerensky that it was condemned by almost the entirety of the other Khans. Those complaints only grew to a whisper when the Great Father himself weighed in pointing out that despite Lefebvre not being a renowned warrior, he had tested well enough to be a mech warrior. Truscott had the man he wanted to work with as a result, 
and he intended, with his Sarkon, to create the agents of the Ilkhan's will. While other clans were incredibly idealistic and ambitious in their own rights, Truscott and Lefebvre were practical, traditional military men by contrast. Teamwork became the watchword of their clan, something increasingly alien to the culture of individual battle prowess and status that permeated the clans as a whole. The pair then built upon the spirit of the army that was already present in the former League soldiers, rather than turning them wholly into duelists. By the time of Operation Klondike, Star Adder had become an incredibly effective military force, even if constrained by Kerensky's new ideals of warfare. The only problem was, even with all of this work put into place by the Star Adders, to prepare the clans for such an operation, with their new doctrines and with their lack of experience, and the mass loss of institutional knowledge appeared almost to be an impossible task. Truscott himself was one of the last holdovers of the Old Guard. Even worse, he also carried the additional burden of being one of the last leaders with anything approaching the experience to run a large-scale campaign, meaning he could rely on almost no one for true assistance in this undertaking. Doctrine and rhetoric cannot win battles, and if considered above experience, will lose the campaign. It is the experience and courage of our warriors, employed by skilled and intrepid commanders decisively and supported by a flexible and hearty logistical chain that will win the campaign. In the absence of one or even two, battles may be won, but the campaign will be lost. Our warriors are experienced and courageous, and our commanders are certainly intrepid. It is in the realm of logistics where we continue to fail. In the process of creating this new society and transforming our military, I fear we have lost the experience we need to support our warriors as they fight this campaign. Khan Absalom Truscott Personal Journals, 17th April, 2817. Operations Sable Sun and Klondike were conceived by the now former general, Khan Absalon Truscott, and it would be his masterful strategy that the whole of the clans would embark upon. This vital military and political enterprise was crafted in intricate detail, describing every major move to make in order to secure victory throughout the proposed offensives, to restore order to this new frontier of space. In the name of the Star League, Nicholas Kerensky and his clans. Unfortunately for Truscott and his allies, there were many problems that emerged during this venture that simply were never an issue under the old SLDF, if only because of the new ways of Kerensky's clans. One of the biggest hurdles was more than just tension from the other clans, as they knew upon seeing these proposals that they were to follow an unclan-like operation and plan, and it would be headed by the Khan of Clan Star Adder, submitting to this outside forces, ideas, and commands. It was, however, the only path forward, but there was more than some who resisted at times, especially when it became clear that these maneuvers required non-warriors to do their roles, with vigor to keep the campaign's logistics moving. Laborers, technicians, and merchants were not valued by the majority of the clan's warriors, the heads of society. Yet these castes would be the ones most needed to actually participate in the offensive, if it was to be successful. Enough of the merchants telling us what we can and cannot do. We are the clans. We are the chosen. Our warriors will assure us victory. And then we will take what we need. 
Sakan Laura Payne of Clan Fire Mandrill. Message to Khan Absalom Truscott, 30 May 2817. In the Battle for Arcadia, during Operation Klondike, the Star Adders were the ones to do the heavy lifting in the opening phase of the invasion on planet. Truscott had drilled and trained his soldiers for every possible order, and for every situation that could arise on this incredibly heavily defended world. Clan Star Adder was still pushed to its limits. The mastermind behind the entire campaign up until this point Absalon Truscott led his soldiers into battle. The adders dropped into a hornet's nest immediately, and the engagement devolved into an absolute bloodbath. Aerospace interceptors and enemy ground forces were used to devastating effect before the star adders could even muster to deploy from their dropships. A fifth of the entirety of star adders' forces were killed fighting against the defending shogunate forces in the opening attack. It was a total mess. Con Truscott was amongst those slain in this tragic encounter, even after his Highlander was disabled. The now former general, Absalon, would use his handheld radio to coordinate his forces in the fierce fighting he and his army found themselves in, before the last true leader and divisional commander of the Star League Defense Forces expired from his injuries on the battlefield. With Truscott's death, the other attacking clans deviated from cooperating with the Star Adders and their command, as well as from one another, immediately taking on their goals as if they were the only ones on planet. They treated their peers from the other clans as competitors now, rather than being the fullest of allies. The Ghost Bears in particular showed full contempt for Clan Star Adder, and the reverse was true as well, at least in these early days with both sides goading one another seemingly. Now, Con Lefaber would complete the campaign for his fallen friend and mentor, as well as for their clan. The Pentagon worlds in their entirety fell one by one afterwards, and for a short time, the world of Arcadia would be the capital of Clan Star Adder, because the star of these Adders would be on the Ascendant, not just from their prowess, doctrine, and leadership, but how those ideals would impact the machines of war they would devise. Because unlike the other clans, Star Adder built their machines for war. Go, Star Adder. You are the stalker, the hunter, the killer. Your prey stands before you. Show them the way of the true warrior. The Remembrance, Clan Star Adder, Passage 5, Verse 17, Lines 20 through 24. After the conclusion of the Pentagon Wars, power began to be divided amongst the victorious clans. While many will know the history, or know of the history, regarding the downfall of Clan Wolverine, who are best known amongst their former peers as the Unnamed, or by contrast people will know the prominence of Clans Wolf, Ghost Bear, Smoke Jaguar, and Jade Falcon, it was the snakes and the stars that were the quiet but true power in this region of space. If only because of their inception, they were the least like their companions. Star Adder's warriors were treated the same, whether freeborn or trueborn. A warrior was a warrior. In other words, worthy is worthy within Star Adder. From the start, this was demonstrated broadly as even their defeated enemies on Arcadia were examined for their use as warriors to fill their badly depleted ranks. It was always pragmatism first, for this scaly, rising serpent in the depths of the periphery. The first Contruscott had left an unmistakable mark and legacy on his people, 
pushing them towards cultural remnants of what the Star League had been, and respecting their civilian castes significantly more than other clans, at least by and large. The Star Riders did not do this out of pure compassion, or mercy, or as a means of defying the Great Father. They did this because it made sense. Merchants, technicians, and laborers fed the war machine. And Clan Star Adder was indeed a war machine. They were valued because they brought great prosperity to the clan, and were respected for it. Some would even describe the atmosphere in their clan as mirroring the family-styled elements of the Ghost Bears. Even if this was more as a result of their pragmatism, rather than the philosophy of family. After the outcome of the conflict which unified this distant new home for mankind, even after the death of their founding Khan, the Adders followed Truscott's vision for how they would secure their future and destiny. Colonization and expansion would be their top priorities, as well as their safeguards in the uncertain future in this far point from Terra. Khan Nefaber, following the guidelines set out for him, secured portions of four new systems and their colonies for Clan Star Adder in quick succession to one another. This triumph was accomplished before Clan Widowmaker's absorption by Clan Wolf, and the death of the father of the clans. One of these newly settled systems carried the name Sheridan, and it would be in this den that the Star Adder would seek to dominate. It's peers. Much of the early history of this planet is unexplored, prior to it becoming the capital world of the Adders in 2837. But it is here that the site of a major industrial zone would be built, one which became the beating heart of the ground forces of the Star Adders throughout much of their reign in the clan homeworlds. Expansion of colonies and assets for the Star Adders would feed this growing manufacturing leviathan. Resources. In the forms of precious and rare materials for building fusion engines and myomers, would be mined across their systems and brought to this new center, like blood coursing through the corridors of the body. Despite their founder bemoaning the lust for power and nature of men, Truscott's children, his clan, became one of the most power-hungry denizens in clan space, even if they attempted to mask their ambitions. They would always require more. Colonies were established or taken with a methodical pace, and very often, these settlements' products would be pumped into the arteries of the Adder's military machine. It would be Site LM-TA-8-10 on Sheridan, its major center for production, that became the core, the heart, of this new network of industrial power. This site was destined to be the home of many of the snake's greatest war machines. In the 31st century, it would be renowned for being the birthing chamber of the terrifying blood asp Omnimech. But in 2829, just prior to the golden century, before the age of the Omnimech, Perhaps one of the greatest war-making battle mechs in the history of the clans was born. Because it was here, in the crucible of Sheridan, that the Warhammer 2C was brought to life. Prior to the clan exodus, the WHM-6R Warhammer and its many derivatives were considered to be some of the greatest accomplishments of Starcore Industries, and of the Terran hegemony that built it. A 70-ton beast, it could fight at almost all ranges. It was well-cooled for the era of its introduction, and it could conceal many of its shortcomings through barriers of raw firepower that would be erected against anyone foolish enough to engage with it. Revisions and upgrades to this series took place throughout its service inside of the Star League and Great Houses, including its vicious and renowned royal configuration which leveraged more advanced Star League technologies to enhance this already terrific battle mech. It was no accident that it became the choice of many gunslinger mech aces, the duelists and veterans of the greatest age of the Star League, and best of all, 
It was a simple design, even in its upgraded state. Nothing is more important for a proper war-making machine. The mech had no major reliability problems throughout the majority of its existence. It was prolific in its distribution, meaning there could always be spare parts, and it was easy to manufacture and maintain for a heavy battle mech. While many would attempt to follow its example, including noteworthy and powerful mechs like the Thug series, none captured its raw effectiveness in warfare. Beloved by soldiers, commanders, and technicians of all stripes, the Warhammer was, for its era, a near-perfect battle mech. For Clan Star Adder, during this time of colonial expansion, industrial and infrastructure development, and dedication to their military production and technology to defend their expanding realm, there was a need to at the very least keep pace with, or surpass, their friends and adversaries in all of these fields. This was a time of new breakthroughs, new war machines, and of new technologies, and to fall behind was to be destroyed or forced into submission. In 2828, it would be Clan Wolf that would take the vaunted Marauder chassis beyond simply upgrading it with new, revolutionary weapons and technology that had been developed since the annihilation of Clan Wolverine. And from the fabrication and assembly lines of Strana Mechdi, Wolf Site No. 2, the first of a new kind of mech, the Marauder 2C, also known as the Marauder Second Generation Clan, first strode off the assembly lines. A race to improve and produce the best weaponry was already taking place inside of the Kerensky Cluster, but this took things to the next level. Nevertheless, even this accomplishment was not the zenith of this competition. That came only a few years later, once they officially entered the Golden Century. The escalation caused by the introduction of this new 85-ton Spectre, however, created two responses. First, the Marauder 2C would quickly proliferate throughout the clans through trials and trades as each clan sought it for themselves, so they could harness its power and ability to redress the balance. Second, it was to compete with it, and Clan Star Adder appears to have done just that. While others were scrambling for their marauders and other battle mechs, the Adders examined the traditional Warhammer, seeing it for its virtues, and realizing that they could evolve it towards a superior, new incarnation, much as the Wolves had done with the Marauder, taking after the first 2C mech, and the Warhammer's spiritual cousin the Thug, the mech's chassis would be increased by 10 tons. This changed the classification of the successor of the original WHM series from a heavy mech to an assault mech. 80 and 85 ton machines do differ from their 90 to 100 ton cousins in some respects, even though they fall within the same tonnage bracket, in that they have many of the same movement profiles and capabilities as heavy mechs. And this frequently makes them more light assaults, or large heavies. This is by no means a bad thing. Indeed, for the purposes of this new, brutal Warhammer chassis, it was perfect. The Star Adders took the foundation of the Warhammer from this point and enhanced it. Its frame, armor, and heat sinks were upgraded to cutting edge clan standards. However, this was not overly expensive or complex for the 29th century. None of these upgrades interfered with the operations of the mech or put it in jeopardy. This new assault chassis, too, benefited from being of clan make and quality, meaning it was inherently more protected by automatically having a case installed in it. Its offensive package, too, would all be upgraded to clan standards, shifting over to new PPCs, new lightweight missiles, and high-quality pulse lasers. What emerged on Sheridan's site LMTA-810 was the perfected Warhammer and a modern, devastating titan of a battle mech. By the logic of the clans, and in particular of Clan Star Adder, which was increasingly wealthy, the mech's cost of production 
was well worth its quality of life upgrades, as well as its vastly heavier defenses and brutally augmented punching power. The mech was straightforward and effective, something which many other clan mechs in the coming decades would never come close to being, all while still being exceptionally dangerous. This was the Star Adder's answer to the advancement of the Wolves and their other compatriots, as a new generation of clan mechs emerged, and this new Warhammer would be almost exclusively their monster to keep. Prior to and during the Golden Century, the Warhammer 2C only proliferated into the hands of Clan Ghost Bear. The Bears and the Star Adders shared significant holdings on Arcadia, and either through trade or through trial, the Bears acquired these machines for themselves at some point during the century, but they were the only ones. A lack or absence of facing off against these machines and their brave Adder Mech Warrior pilots as well as an absence of decision-making skills, would conclude in wild misfortune for the extremely aggressive Clan Mongoose, who would, in 2844, launch an unprovoked assault on Clan Star Adder's holdings, the masters of this reborn Lord of War, striking out against two of their primary resource colonies on Tathis and Marshall to seize these sites for themselves. The mongooses would miscalculate their enemy's resolve in the face of this aggression. On Tathis, they would be undone in quick order, having accidentally struck while Star Adder Sankan Nabuta was visiting. But their successes would be much greater on Marshall. They would crush two binaries of defenders with a full cluster before massacring the local populace, which had taken up arms to defend their homes. Tens of thousands were killed, and a blood debt was now owed. Con Clancy Truscott, the born son of the founder of the clan, as well as Sakon Nabuta, were driven into a rage when the news of this attack broke. Nabuta would track Star Colonel Riley, the leader of the cluster and his men, to Tokasha, a recent colony of the Mongooses. Justice would be handed out on the battlefield as the cluster was crushed and the Sakon personally executed the Mongoose's Star Colonel for his crimes. The headless body was sent to Con Davis Riley of Clan Mongoose, with a simple note reading. This is your Sukarid. To forgive is expected. To forget is impossible. Tokasha, now a Star Adder world, and its colonies would be reinforced with new defenders, and more settlers. The Star Adders had learned their lesson. It is unknown how much of a role the Warhammer 2C played in the fighting in this campaign, due to the still relatively limited numbers of the mech that had been produced up until this point. For instance, Sakon Nabuta was reported to have piloted a thug rather than a Warhammer 2C, but these exploitive, unprovoked attacks, and their rebuttal would take these two clans down the road to hell, where the Warhammer 2C most certainly was on display, fighting in one of the most desperate campaigns in the history of Clan Star Adder, one which nearly saw the clan completely undone. In 2863, almost 20 years after their failed venture, Clan Mongoose would direct their aggression once more against Clan Star Adder, but this time, in full force. They also unleashed a new technology, a new advancement that Clan Star Adder had been slow to adopt. The Omnimech. Galaxies of these new invaders of various types crashed into Star Adder's holdings. The mighty Warhammer 2C was a component of the Adder military, and would have taken to the field along with a host of other sophisticated, standard battle mechs. These military machines were seemingly no match for these new, devilish machines, however, despite the Adder's best efforts. Then Khan Banak of Clan Star Adder tried directly to rally his forces during the collapse of his Tumen's front lines across multiple worlds, but to no avail. We cannot be sure of the conditions of these battles. It appears that the Mongooses must have had localized superiority of numbers 
as it can be inferred that they were able to refit their Omnimechs for different battles more rapidly, using their mechs as a force multiplier as the stunned Star Adders tried to respond and to pivot to defend their worlds. Despite the full power of mechs like the Warhammer 2C, or its cousin the Marauder 2C, and a host of other battle mechs being on hand to fight this war against the Mongooses, Clan Star Adder would lose a full half of its worlds. Their reliable, deadly destroyer had failed in its first true major test. All of their battle mechs had. Though perhaps it had been the Star Adders themselves that failed. The records are too incomplete to understand this campaign to the fullest, beyond what the Star Adders hold responsible for their shortcomings. But they would salvage a host of these new Mongoose Omnimex all the same, reverse engineering them, adapting the Fallen, or building their own, before only a handful of years later, unleashing a counterattack with vengeance and venom in their hearts against their most hated Mongoose rivals. This was the beginning of the end for Clan Mongoose, who were driven back in a series of brutal battles across occupied worlds. During the campaign and slaughter of these events too, Clan Smoke Jaguar took their own opportunity to exact their revenge. By the end of these wars, it would be the Jaguars who would claim the skull of the Mongoose through a trial of absorption. The Warhammer 2C, this reliable, war-winning weapon, played a secondary role in a campaign where the Star Adders saw success and saw the recovery of their worlds. There would be conflicts with a host of other clans in the rest of the century as well, but increasingly, these new wars were fought with Omnimex. The clan thrived as never before, claiming new worlds and colonizing new systems, bringing up more riches and deposits of precious raw materials into the snake's ever-tightening grip. However, despite their accomplishments in the first half of the 29th century, the Warhammer 2C began to regress into the shadows, being embarrassingly labeled a second-line mech. An assault mech weighing in at 80 tons, the Warhammer 2C is the most powerful successor to the Warhammer that exists as of the latest era of Battletech, the Ill Clan era. This colossus, through the use of advanced clan technologies, but not the most expensive and decadent ones, became a deadly, cost-effective brute. Because of the quality of its clan chassis, finite ammunition, and weapons positioning, it can even fulfill the role of a vaunted zombie mech if necessary. The Star Adder upgraded WHM series has been in action for centuries. This very strong base chassis would be used to manufacture an additional 12 offshoot configurations. These alternatives were conceived entirely based on the strength of the original. The mech in its base form has also had its electronics and individual weapons replaced with newer components over the centuries as well. The variant and specific components here document pieces produced by the Raven Alliance in its latest run of the mech, but may not always be reflective of the first model manufactured on Sheridan by Clan Star Adder. To start delving into the core features of this machine and its body, its base SJR-80 Endo chassis uses Clan Endo Steel, as its name indicates. This reduces its internal structure from 8 tons down to 4, and this is vital to the mech's other assets. It does take up several critical spaces on board, though the Warhammer 2C does have the space regardless. Especially when factoring in that Clan Endo Steel is not nearly as intrusive or voluminous as its corresponding Inner Sphere and Star League equivalents. After this, the Warhammer 2C comes with a standard gyro and cockpit due to the limitations of its time of original development, as much as because of their tried and true nature. In order to keep the mech cool, 
With its very heavy laser weapon focused offensive package, the Star Adder engineers gave the mech a respectable 20 clan double heat sinks, letting it reduce its thermal load by 40 every turn. This is inadequate for the Warhammer to Alpha Strike without consequences, but it can easily and safely bracket fire its aggressive options as needed. Alpha striking at every opportunity is, in a word, unwise. For its onboard electronic systems, it is served by a TDWS 37 MK 2.2 communications package, as well as a Hades CT 44 targeting and tracking system. Neither of these confer the Warhammer 2C any bonuses, unfortunately. In regards to its onboard quirks, which are usable in the advanced rules, it has the searchlight feature, helping it with night conditions, albeit by revealing its own location at the same time, as well as the stable design trait, which gives the mech a bonus when executing piloting skill rules as a result of a physical attack. The single most defining trait of any battle mech in determining their fates on the battlefield is movement. A mech which is too slow cannot fight as a recon mech or striker asset. A machine that is too quick will sacrifice too much to be a battle line mech in many conditions. The clans as a whole would exploit their advanced clan tech XL engines to save a great deal of tonnage inside of their battle mechs. This means that many of their battle line heavy mechs move at the speed of the Star League's light heavies or mediums, rather than at the traditional rate of battle for the inner sphere. There is a cost that comes with an XL engine, not only in terms of its immense price, but also in terms of the unit's survivability. While these clan tech power plants are less likely to result in the catastrophic destruction of the battle mech than the prior Star League XL fusion engines, this vulnerability is still present. The Star Adders, when conceptualizing their upgraded Warhammer, clearly opted to not take this engine type on board. We can speculate as to why, though I would think it's obvious. First, it keeps the cost of the mech down, making it slightly easier to service and manufacture. Next, it reduces the chances of the mech being knocked out by having the key weakness of the XL engine, that being of course, engine destruction. The only way to do this to a Warhammer 2C is to go straight through the center torso, which is easier said than done. Finally, it's because the battle mech just doesn't need it to be effective. The extra tonnage could have found a purpose, but it likely would have created more problems like the clan Omnimex have, that being, it could be overgunned. So, to get the steel behemoth moving, it is driven forward by a 22.5 ton Type 10 320 fusion standard engine. This heavy duty power plant gives the Warhammer 2C a maximum speed of 64 km per hour, or 6 movement points in the tabletop game. For the Warhammer, sadly, this isn't as fast as many of its peers, like the future Gargoyle or Summoner, but by not striving to match these movement rates, it has a layer of survivability that these other mechs just do not have. Given its role as a generalist and brawler, it doesn't really feel like it needs those attributes either. To be a clan assault mech of any weight tier, even in the more primitive times of the 29th century, means to have access to the widest array of protective components available until functionally the Blakest or Dark Age eras of Battletech. For the Warhammer 2C, what does this mean specifically? To begin with, as alluded before, it has a clan chassis, and that means that the 2C automatically has a case system inserted into its very internal structure. This has the significance that if its ammunition on board is struck, which to be clear is not an optimal outcome in the middle of a firefight with its enemies, and especially so while there are still active elements to it remaining, the explosion that follows will be localized into the side torso and won't spread into other sections of the mech. This is invaluable to any clan machine, as it means they can stay in the fight or buy time to escape as needed. After this general clan tech feature, we get to the main course, as there is no invisible layers of defense to this straightforward battle mech. In order to gain the most it can out of its physical bulwark, 
the Warhammer 2C is covered in forging ZM15 ferrofibrous plating, yielding the mech a respectable 230 points of armor. This relatively heavy wall of security does mean that the Warhammer 2C can shirk off significant blows from all but the heaviest of weapon systems, as an assault or breakthrough mech should. It is essential to its role on the battlefield, and it's one of the virtues of the battle mech. Altogether, it is an impressive change from its inspired design, as this level of protection and the investment in it is the largest divergence between the 2C and the original. It contrasts the two mechs greatly, as the Warhammer was renowned for being slightly underguarded. To be blunt, the same argument cannot be said of this variant of its successor. The original Warhammer chassis was also renowned for its mixed range of offensive systems and its ability to hit like a freight train at almost any distance. This virtue was not lost by any means when the Star Adders evolved the design into its new 80-ton form. With the benefit of clan weapon systems, the 2C is extremely heavily gunned, even when factoring in the mass of its standard engine. It has a total of 24.5 tons of weaponry on board, and every ton is spent wisely for it to achieve battlefield dominance. For striking at long range, or punching through the thickest of enemy armor, the Warhammer 2C comes armed, in its current production variant, with a pair of Type DDS Kingston Extended Range Particle Projection Cannons. These are the successors to the Warhammer's original standard PPCs, and they impact their intended targets, or victims, with the force of a Gauss rifle. Just to be clear as to their placement in the vehicle, there is one in each arm. The two can be fired together every turn due to its robust cooling capabilities, so long as the mech is operating in a normal environment or has not suffered catastrophic engine damage. While using them in tandem with its other systems can cause problems if it overindulges, inherently Two Clan ER PPCs crashing into a mech or tank every turn is something no reasonable opponent can take lightly, or more importantly, ignore. Next up is truthfully its main killing system. Yes, despite PPCs being very scary, and potentially headshotting their desired targets with a lucky attack, these aren't what the Warhammer will use to finish its enemies off, or ground them into dust. Light mechs may think they can go one-on-one -on -one with the Great One, and may be so arrogant as to think they can potentially flank this juggernaut, but the Warhammer 2C and its pilots should not, and are not exactly worried about accurately hitting annoyances that overstep themselves. Why? Because it is armed with five clan-quality 14A medium pulse lasers. Each one of these lands for 7 damage, essentially half that of its deadly Clantech PPCs, but are exceptionally accurate. Pulse lasers also have the advantage of making successful attacks on a positive 2 modifier. When all 5 fire together, they will generate 35 points of damage, provided they all find their intended victim, which is more than substantial. This all means that firing at long range with these lasers is like attacking at medium range, their medium range is like attacking at close range, and their close range is too easier to hit than just the base results to strike a target. Flankers and lighter assets will be quickly dispatched if they are caught by this array of laser weaponry, and even heavier mechs will be stripped quickly of their outer layers of armor. These precise killers are the real, almost forgotten enemy for those who battle the 2C. Many will panic about its PPCs, and deservedly so only to discover it was the lasers which tore their mechs to pieces. To round out this deadly assembly of destruction, Clan Star Adder installed a Pattern J7 SRM-6 pack into the mech. This lightweight missile launcher may not have the same virtues as a streak system, but it does still add scatter damage to the Warhammer's attacks. Even more optimally, if the mech is being sent into an urban environment, where infantry may be a consideration, its one ton of ammunition may be swapped out for Inferno Rounds, giving it a more than healthy defense against on-foot opposition. You know, I've heard it be said that incoming incendiary attacks 
are an infantryman's best friend. All combined, the Warhammer 2C can fire its entire deadly arsenal, save one particle projection cannon, and walk, all while being heat neutral. Alternatively, it can run and fire its two PPCs while still firing two lasers, or a laser in its SRM, and once more still achieve being heat neutral. It's extremely versatile, and if managed correctly and with restraint, it will punch holes in its enemies before slicing them into pieces with its precision-based laser fire, and then shotgunning its doomed opposition with an SRM-6. Every ton of weaponry is well spent. It is adaptable and powerful. The Warhammer 2C in its base form is one of the best balanced static configuration mechs of its era, and despite canonically suffering against Omnimechs, it is in reality, in battles waged in a game of armored combat, never found wanting. It is simple to build and maintain by clan standards. It is mobile enough to not be left vulnerable on most battlefields, and even if slower than some of its later clan counterparts, this can be made up for in its other virtues. Its protection is superb, and it is only diminished once more advanced armor types enter the setting, all while being significantly more durable than many of its peers due to its lack of an XL engine. All of its weaponry is smartly configured and can be superbly bracketed as to not overheat. It does not suffer from being too heavily armed for its weight tier and purpose, like many of its competitors. At range, it has two potential kill shots every turn. In close, it has the ability to shred enemies with pulse laser fire, all while still punching holes with one PPC and then savaging them with its SRMs afterwards. In other words, the Warhammer 2C, first birthed by the engineers and scientists of Clan Star Adder, before even the death of the Great Father, is an excellent machine for actual warfare, which lined up perfectly with how Clan Star Adder behaved throughout its appearances in the setting. There is a reason why, 300 years later, this battle mech is still much desired, both by new users in the Inner Sphere and by would-be clan operators. It might be the Adder's greatest gift to warfare, and one of its many slights against humanity, in the contributions to real suffering it has enabled. Like shining stars, the warriors descended, a fiery rain to purify and punish, yet even angels can be corrupted, brought low by base desires. The Remembrance, Passage 25, Verse 3, Lines 9 through 11. At one time, it had been unique. For an entire era, in fact, the Warhammer 2C barely slipped far from the tight embrace of its Star Adder masters, with it only falling into the claws of Clan Ghost Bear throughout the formative years of the clans. By the time of the political century, the era after the Golden One, this exclusivity ended. There was surely an abundance of reasons for this, but the arrival of the Omnimech would clearly be chief amongst them. Clan chassis had a tendency to spread, especially at this early time, and with Star Adder no longer viewing this as a premier unit, the urge to defend an increasingly dated and sadly second-line battle mech would in all probability not have been given priority. Thus, every clan would gain access to this durable and reliable second line machine. It's unknown how many manufactured it themselves in the clan homeworlds, such as the case with the widespread Mad Dog, a smoked jaguar creation that spread largely the same way, 
or how many of them traded for these machines and acquired support parts. But regardless of the clan, they would all have the Warhammer 2C by this era. The tragedy for the chassis, of course, would be by this time, its decline in usage. Yes, it had spread across the Kerensky Cluster. However, it was to be a tool for those with the least prestige, or who were declining in their abilities. Fewer Premier Trials would see this mechanical monster participate, especially between galaxies of note. The hierarchy of clan material distribution and priority is a very simple one. Frontline galaxies, those of most renown and fame, at this time, would be almost entirely stocked by the most able Omnimex and warriors. After this, you begin to fall into second line and garrison units. Second line galaxies are by no means without teeth. However, their clusters are broken up into a mixture of reliable and less reliable groups. Second line clusters, the main strong arm of these formations, will still broadly use Omnimex, though not exclusively, and will have solid logistical support. Their Omnimex, however, may not have the full array of configurations available and to hand, and they will certainly lack customization. For many warriors, to be assigned to a second line cluster is considered an honor all the same. Those inside of these units are those who just didn't quite make the cut to make it into their vaunted first line galaxies of their clan of origin. Second line clusters tend to be given secondary roles in military campaigns. They will hold captured areas or act as a guard for their more offense oriented peers in higher tier galaxies. But second line galaxies are not wholly made up of second line clusters. They will also be the home of what are called Provisional Garrison Clusters. Some clans break these formations entirely away from their second line units too, to be clear, creating their own Provisional Galaxies, but it is the norm for these to be a part of the unit structure of second line Galaxies. These dead ends are hardly draped in glory or hope, really. They are made up, frequently, of the reviled disgraced warriors, soldiers past their clan-imposed expiration date, and free births who manage to eke out entry into the clan's warrior system. The latter is particularly and grimly amusing, as this is viewed as an elevation in the society, but in most clans, ironically barring Star Adder, the clan that built the Warhammer 2C, they are relegated to the bottom tier status in their army structure and are hindered from progressing, barring the most extreme breakout examples. These clusters are unfortunately given the dismal task of being rear guards, or holding unimportant objectives, or being stationed in places where there is little of value to protect, or being expendable troops as needed. Their most rewarding task unless things have gone totally awry during a set of missions or general campaigning, is to be used to clean up already broken enemy forces that the first and second line clusters didn't bother to finish off. These clusters are an ignoble place during the political century, and even the clan invasion, where truly mighty and logistically viable machines like the Warhammer 2C were unceremoniously dumped after the arrival of the Omnimech and how true-born clan warriors had adapted their own forms of warfare, the Omnimech was king. The flaws these machines had just didn't play into combat in the clan homeworlds. It's easy to examine these shortcomings now, especially after the failure of Operation Revival, otherwise known as the clan invasion, but it gives you an idea. They're incredibly high cost, dependence on Omnipod capsules to insert systems, difficulty to build, and difficulty to repair and maintain when supply chains came under duress, were all extraordinarily negative modifiers when it came to launching real military operations. These mechs, in essence, burnt out quickly. When well supplied with Omnipods, and when the machines weren't totally irretrievably lost, or severely damaged, Omnimechs can be ready for battle day in and day out, acting almost as a force multiplier even. However, 
The stresses of a long campaign and attrition, especially with a weak supply chain, will see these mech's capabilities atrophy rapidly for any force solely built around them. In short, for every one of these mechs lost, they are lost effectively forever in a long campaign. Replacements will come late, unless there is already an overwhelming numerical superiority over the enemy and substantial material reserves. The conclusion to this, ironically, is that second-line galaxies, with their provisional garrison clusters, the supposed dregs of the warrior caste, were sitting on top of battle mechs far more suited for real combat activity, especially when factoring in difficulties with replacing parts and components once Omnipods either ran out, or when repairs would be otherwise impossible. It may take longer for a Warhammer 2C to replace out its PPC, but it can be repaired under almost any conditions. An Omnimech needs a high level of base support just to make that happen. One of the most valuable clan assault mechs of later eras was little more than a hand-me-down, training wheels, a retirement prize, or a participation trophy for the clan warriors it was assigned to, even if effective. Even if knowing it could bite back with real lethality in a fight, the 2C was simply not an Omnimech. That was it, and its related design's greatest sin in the eyes of the martial obsessed society that spawned it. What should have been a mech with distinction, conferring that distinction to the warriors who piloted it, it was relegated to a diminished status, and diminished the status of those who helmed the mech in turn. The scale of this misjudgment by the clans at large, in terms of how they treated their second-line battle mechs, and especially masterpieces of conflict like the Warhammer 2C during this time, cannot be overstated. Funnily enough, all of the virtues of second-line mechs, these static machines, would be looked upon in a different light after the political century and clan invasion were concluded. During the political century itself, though, regardless of the preference of clan warriors for Omnimex, the Warhammer 2C would continue to be built and maintained, with even a new configuration of the mech emerging. Manufactured originally in 2920, the better part of a century after the first Warhammer 2C, the Warhammer 2C 2 is a major realignment of the role and weapons package of this already deadly mech on the battlefield. Whereas the original Star Adder derived mech is a mixed range brawler, and one that will take targets apart in close while still hammering them at range. The 2C2 instead goes almost entirely in on its dedicated long-range support. It is not truly known which specific clan is the origin of this variant, though it was fielded for the first time against the Inner Sphere by Clan Smoke Jaguar. Whether they are the true originators, as speculated by the original technical readout 3055, or it was Clan Star Adder, or it comes from one of its many adopters, is not currently known. Regardless of who was its true creators, it does a superb job at what the clans envisioned it for. The mech's internal structure, engine, armor, and heat sinks remain entirely unchanged, meaning the only major difference the mech has is in the realm of its weapon systems. Contributing to its long-range role already, it retains its twin extended-range particle projection cannons. Because of the alteration of its focus, its original medium pulse lasers are stripped out and their 10 tons are put towards scatter damage options at long range. Twin Clan LRM-15 launchers are fitted into the battle mech instead, with one in each side torso. These not only complement the PPCs in a very real way, they can also be launched in close, unlike Inner Sphere LRMs. That of course entails that if anyone does think that this 80 ton figure is unguarded in close, they will be in for a rude awakening. The twin launchers have a total of 12 rounds of ammunition each, by the way. After this, it actually retains its SRM-6 for a close-range bite on top of all of that, 
or for contributing to the misery of infantry with Inferno Rounds. When combined together, its PPCs and LRMs will drive the mech to 40 points of heat in a single volley, matching its heat sink total. Notably, I should point out, if it does this while walking or running, the 2C will slowly edge its heat total higher and higher. But cycling out an LRM launcher every few turns will avoid this. Certainly, the 2C is less accurate and close, and its damage is less reliable due to the nature of missiles. It doesn't really matter, though, as its role is very much different from its originator. PPC blasts will shred targets, before missiles will rain down upon them. It is a very dangerous, long-range support machine, and one that will not be toppled in close so easily. For the day will come and our kin will stand on Terra's firm soil, ready to rebuild the Star League with their hearts and hands. But who shall lead? Upon whose shoulders will the burden lie? The answer is the test. The test is the journey. Whichever clan carves its way through the barbarians to reach that fabled cradle of us all shall be the vehicle of the League's rebirth. Upon the Star League throne shall sit that clan's wisest con. So should it be, so shall it be. The Remembrance, Passage 72, Verse 22, Lines 14 through 24. Throughout the political century, there was an ideological struggle that ravaged its way through the clans. This was focused mostly around two belief systems that were battling for supremacy. One of these was the concept of the Crusaders, and the other was the concept of the Wardens. Crusaders believed in the righteousness of the clans, and knew that Nicholas Kerensky had wanted his descendants to conquer the Inner Sphere and re-establish the Star League. By contrast, the Wardens believed it was their passed on duty from the Founder to protect the Inner Sphere, but from afar. Ironically, the latter of these most likely adhered to an idea much closer to what General Alexander Kerensky wanted, more than his son, the actual founder of the clans, Nicholas. For Clan Star Adder, this controversy was something which pulled at their own ideological underpinnings. The Star Adders believed that the clans themselves would unite under one banner before a call to invade the Inner Sphere was made, or any other decisions regarding the fate of the former Star League inside of the home of mankind. However, the pull for the desire for new conquests, even by the seemingly level-headed Empire Builders, was just too much, and Clan Star Adder's warriors would firmly stand in the Crusader camp when they made their decision to pick a side. This had political ramifications across the clans, and kicked off a bitter conflict between Clans Star Adder and Coyote, one which would impact their relations almost indefinitely going forwards. A cabal using deception, plots, and schemes emerged from within both clans, as a means of progressing the Crusader cause. It was done in a way to try to force Clan Coyote into being absorbed into Clan Star Adder, with a less than forthright way of delivering them. And that was most definitely dishonorable. The Coyotes themselves had been split on the Crusader question up until this point, and this was a way for the Crusaders within the Coyotes to cement their status as Crusaders indefinitely by betraying their own clan to become one with Star Adder. The conspiracy backfired. From within Clan Star Adder itself, 
Their Sakan was punished for their role in the scheme with their demotion and removal, after a trial of grievance was launched by their own Khan over it. For Coyote, it would not only fuel their disdain for the Adders moving forward, and further enhance their views of them being both Desgra and of a maligned ideological bent, but it would make the clan shift towards being resolute in their warden principles. Coyote, after purging this rogue element of crusaders, was a warden clan seemingly without equal, perhaps only matched by Clan Wolf. The Adders and the Coyotes, needless to say, came to blows during the grievances that emerged with one another after this shameful affair. Only one year after the fighting had started as a result of this feud, Clan Jade Falcon made their call to begin the process of invading the Inner Sphere. This proposal, unfortunately for the Crusaders, was derailed due to the efforts of the Warden clans, though as you already can assume, this was not to be the last time this would take place, as the invasion did eventually launch in the middle of the 31st century. Turmoil emerged in the aftermath as trials were issued, and it was only after the agreement of the Dragoon Compromise that things would settle for a time amongst the Wardens and the Crusaders. Clan Wolf, as a part of this arrangement, formed and sent the Wolf's Dragoons to the Inner Sphere to gather intelligence and report back to the clans the status of the uncivilized barbarians of the Inner Sphere. This, in theory, would inform the clans of their military, industrial, and political positions. Star Adder 2 would play its role in all of this, in that they reluctantly backed the compromise. Their own wary nature of overextension and an unwillingness to charge in blindly overwhelmed their sense of aggression and pride, making them one of the Crusader clans to first come to the consensus that they needed the Wolf's Dragoons. In fact, the Adders even attempted to support Clan Wolf in this endeavor with materials and manpower, but were politely rebuffed by their Warden counterparts. When the Dragoons departed for the Inner Sphere, the Star Adders began their preparations for the invasion, in hopes that they would be at the forefront of it. Unlike the other clans, though, they didn't assume anything about the barbarians they faced. Their opponents would have the benefit of short supply routes, defensible positions, and a lack of honor about them. Anticipation ran high for decades as the Star Adders began a rigorous training process for their frontline galaxies. Their garrison clusters were used as stand-ins for Inner Sphere forces, and were instructed to mimic what they believed Inner Sphere troops would behave like. But that wasn't all, as their industries were primed for the attack, and they began to design new Omnimechs like the Adder specifically for engagements against the Inner Sphere. This meant Star Adder was preparing, from day one, to fight enemies who would not abide by clan doctrines. It also meant that the Warhammer 2C would play a role in these war games. Provisional garrison clusters were, after all, equipped with far more static, traditional battle mechs, like the Warhammer 2C, and rarely had Omnimechs. In these drills, they would be put up against the best frontline Omnimex the Star Adders had, and this process was ongoing for years, decades even, letting these beasts be used as they were intended. These drills and war games too must have had a sharpening effect on the provisional garrison cluster's unit cohesion, command, and confidence as well, enhancing all those who participated not just the frontline clusters of the clan. Unknowingly, despite preparing to fight the Inner Sphere, the Star Adders were ruthlessly turning their Tumen into an army of very well-adjusted, experienced teams, and something that would be extremely effective at taking down other clan forces. While the Dragoons eventually let their intelligence reports drop off, and then went dark, the Star Adders did not move against the Wardens, and didn't make the same noise as many of their Crusader counterparts over this obvious, or at the very least apparent, treason. No. 
Instead, they waited, continuing to sharpen their blades and engaging in combat against other clans only to acquire yet more resources as they required them. The Bastion of the Warhammer 2C was already a part of a resurgence of the use of second line mechs, even if it was unintentional. Its true value would be shown sooner rather than later, once the invasion itself began. My fellow Khans, if we are to have any hope of achieving our goal, we will need all of us working together in solidarity. To confront the corruption of the Inner Sphere with only three or four facets of our total strength, as the rest of you advocate, is to embrace madness and invite our own eventual destruction. To go to war with only archers and footmen and leave behind our cavalry and siege engines is utmost folly. We must face this threat together, with one mind, as the Founders' unity intended. Stardada Khan Cassius and Buta, the Halls of the Great Khans, Katusha, Strana Michti, December 13th, 3048. Misfortune for the sum total of mankind came in the form of a jump ship stumbling upon the Huntress system in 3048. With this arrival of the Explorer Corps vessel from Comstar, after decades of having lost contact with the Wolf's Dragoon seemingly, a clan intervention into the Inner Sphere was almost immediately put on the table. Con Leo Showers of Clan Smoke Jaguar would go on to convince the clans through having captured the ship and releasing doctored and coerced information that their time to strike was now, before it was too late. Everything was manipulated to his cause. The Federated Commonwealth and the Accord of Captian were the building blocks of a new Star League, one without them. And the arrival of the outbound light was already proof that this new entity was intending to expand. This was enough to sway the Council especially with the other concerns inside of each clan on that council. It just simply worked for too many clans, including the interests of the neutral ones, to justify their aggression. With his politics employees, Showers was granted the title of Ilkhan of the clans, and set in motion the final stages of what would become the inevitable launch of the clan invasion, Operation Revival. The supposed liberation of the Inner Sphere from the yoke of the Great Houses, and the restoration of the Star League, under Clan Rule. The one who would be in charge of this new Star League and the Inner Sphere as a whole, would be whoever reached Terra first, and became the Ill Clan Kerensky envisioned. Star Outer Khan Cassius Nabuta, during the great meeting to determine the fate of the invasion itself and their own final destinies, had wanted to have Clan Star Outer administer the attack, as Absalon Truscott had administered Operation Klondike. This would allow the other clans to indulge their specialized roles, as he perceived them, of course. The unified clans would strike at the very heart of the Inner Sphere, and crush all opposition. Nothing could stand before their technology, warships, warrior spirits, and battle mechs. Unity would be their watchword, and victory would come through decisive, coordinated command and cooperation. This was not adopted, however, because it couldn't be. Most glaringly, it pushed against the authority of Leo Showers, more than just that, it would suppress the ambitions and the desires of the clans. The invasion the Star Adders had rigorously prepared for would be for nothing. Con Cassius knew right away. It went as he predicted. The other Crusaders would prosecute the invasion with as few clans as their pride would allow them to. The invasion would fail. 
it would be an unwieldy, self-destructive group of competing interests. Their egos would intercede at every opportunity and diminish their fighting potential. As the Star Adder Khans watched this unfold, they bid in such a way that their clan would never be in contention to participate in the assault. They believed it to be unwinnable. Instead, in their contempt for the others, they sought power to ensure that unity would be achieved in the home for the clans. While all of you are off forsaking the unity of the Inner Sphere, we shall remain here to watch you fall. And fall you shall. We will make certain of that. Star Radakan, Cassius and Buta's thoughts, Strana Mishti, 13th of December, 3048. By 3049, inside of the Inner Sphere, Clans Wolf, Smoke Jaguar, Ghost Bear, and Jade Falcon served as the spearhead descending into the figurative flesh of the Federated Commonwealth, the unified state of House Davian and Steiner, as well as into the newly formed Free Rosselhaig Republic, the periphery state known as the Oberon Confederation, and the Draconis Combine, the seat of power for House Carita. These strategic thrusts were vicious and without mercy, but for all of their strength and warrior spirit, each was ground down with time. After the convenient death of Leo Showers, and the election of his replacement, Ulrich Kerensky of Clan Wolf, he went on to activate the reserve clans, which the operation had prepared for, clans Novakat and Steel Viper, while effectively activating by the end of the invasion, Diamond Shark as well. Under the guidance of Ilkhan Ulrich Karensky, their failure was complete, just as the leadership of Clan Star Adder had predicted. It was while he was in overall command of the clans, for instance, that there was the catastrophe on Luthien, followed by the humiliating defeat and setback on Tukiid where clan forces were halted by the Comguards in one of the biggest battles in the history of the Inner Sphere. Only clans Wolf and Ghost Bear would fully retain their dignity, while Jade Falcon managed to scrape together a supposed draw. The Crusader cause in the Inner Sphere then started to immediately erode, as the Ghost Bears decisively turned from Crusader to Warden. After the 15-year truce was cemented with Comstar in the outcome of this historic battle, the real fighting for the Warhammer 2C would begin in the Inner Sphere. However, it would not march under the banner of its creators, Clan Star Adder, but instead it'd be under those who had adopted it. The mech scarcely saw use in the campaign up until this point, save for some fighting by several clans on Tukiid. This would be where the mech shined. Far away from clan logistics hubs, with so many of their Omnimechs destroyed, those who held ground, provisional garrison clusters, and even second-line mech warriors dispossessed of their Omnimechs, would mount these mighty 80-ton destroyers, and a series of other supposedly inferior mechs, in order to fight back against the waves of incoming mercenaries, House raiders, pirates, and uprisings that would sweep over the clan's bitterly contested gains in the almost sacred Inner Sphere. Without Omnipods being shipped reliably to the Inner Sphere, or being able to replace destroyed Omnitech, these second-line mechs held the line against the counterattacks and banditry of the Inner Sphere powers. They could mount weaponry from other broken machines. They could be repaired with relative ease and they would fight like hell. Even in disputes between clans, second-line mechs like the Warhammer 2C started to show their teeth once more, roaring like old lions who'd found new strength at long last. Precious Omnimechs were squandered in trials as they were torn down by the might of this giant. The Warhammer 2C, reborn in its purpose purely through necessity. 
More than anyone else, the maimed and crippled Diamond Sharks would see the value in this second line firebreak. In the process of rebuilding their clan under new management, much more closely aligned with their merchant caste, the Warhammer 2C began to flourish, as it hadn't since before the time of the Omnimech. Though despite the beginnings of a resurgence, the 2C and a vast number of other clan battle mechs would be pitted against impossible odds when the full force of the now reunified Second Star League under the Inner Sphere collided with Clan Smoke Jaguar. No matter the will to fight, outnumbered by a ridiculous factor by the Inner Sphere, the Jaguars would collapse. Their wholesale destruction became the greatest catalyst for change in the history of the clan since the death of Kerensky, all due to the valiant warriors of the Inner Sphere. And with this shifting of priorities, both in the Clan Invasion Corridor and in the Homeworlds, the rate of transformation amongst the clans would proceed with haste. The shark is the ultimate pelagic predator. The shark ceaselessly patrols the blue depths. Its black eyes gather the ocean's meager light as it endlessly searches for the scent of blood, or for the tremors of a thrashing fish. Far from the blooms of plankton that anchor the web of life near reefs and shallows, the ocean deeps are vast blue deserts. The predators that survive in these barren waters must forever be on the lookout for prey. To survive, the shark must always be moving. The Remembrance, Passage 152, Verse 6 The Battle of Tukiid reverberated through clan society like a shockwave from a bomb blast. This was to have been their great moment, a chance to reclaim Terra and resurrect the Star League in their image, and it was stripped away from them by the other descendants of the League, the shadowy organization that resided on Terra, Comstar. Every engagement on Tukiid was hard fought and bloody. But no clan suffered on Tukiid, like Clan Diamond Shark suffered. Their agony, nevertheless, is the catalyst for what brought the Warhammer 2C into the next stage of its development, and was responsible for its spreading like wildfire throughout the realm of the Great Houses. To see the full picture as to why, let us examine the proliferating faction itself with a keener eye from a much earlier time, the Diamond Sharks. The clan in question had a long history on their road to the Calamitous Battle, and their pathway to becoming the masters of the Warhammer 2C in the Inner Sphere. Founded as Clan Sea Fox, their first con, David Kalasa, had been inspired by Nicholas Krensky's primary speechwriter and one of his aides, Karen Nagasawa who inevitably joined Clan Sea Fox upon the founding of the clans. The Sea Foxes even credit Karen Nagasawa with the initial creation of the Remembrances. Nagasawa ended up becoming the second Khan of the Sea Foxes, after the death of Colossa during the Seizing of Babylon in Operation Klondike. The clan had a reputation of having a progressive bent by clan standards from the very start of its formation. In fact, near this very beginning, Khan Nagasawa believed material prosperity had been the key for the Star League's success. By contrast, most of her fellow Khans in other clans, of course, focused their attention on the military supremacy of the SLDF, whether consciously or subconsciously, and this is one reason the Foxes were unique amongst their brethren at the time. 
Cooperation through trade was a founding principle of Seafox. It was in their very core. Incentivizing the lower castes through attempts at a higher quality of life, within reason for the clans of course, was considered to be very effective at cementing loyalty of non-warriors within the clan, and was always at least somewhat of a priority until the 31st century. Their laborers were more loyal, their scientists performed more wonders, including the perfection of the iron womb technology I should add. However, the caste that benefited the most from Nagasawa's vision for her clan were the merchant caste. Amongst the homeworld clans, their merchants became the dominant power, barring early competition by Clan Wolverine, and later being checked somewhat by Clan Jade Falcon. Amongst the planets brought under the guidance of Nicholas Kerensky, the Sea Foxes were the center of commerce. Their dealings in materials and information were unmatched by almost any of their associates, who simply didn't value it in the same way as the Sea Foxes. This is mostly due to the warriors of the other clans not allowing their merchants a free hand in operation, as they viewed this behavior as being very much against Kerensky's vision. During the Golden Century, much like Clan Star Adder, the Sea Foxes were one of the clans to focus heavily on colonization and exploration, though they also dealt in trading with these newly established colonies, including those founded by their peer competitors. Becoming a dominant market power in the new frontier for humanity, uplifting and empowering their castes, and manipulating other clans through trade, became the signature of Clan Sea Fox as it became a true power amongst the descendants of the SLDF. This era was considered to be the peak of the merchant caste within the Sea Foxes, at least until the latter half of the 31st century. Envy, jealousy, and contempt began to seep into the other clans as they viewed this unclan-like behavior, however, and there would be a price to be paid. In 2984, a rigid conservative was elected as Khan of Clan Seafox, Damon Clark. He believed the other castes had been given free reign for far too long. The warrior caste was the first among all castes, as laid out by the Great Father. While many expected radical changes within the ranks of the clan, and a shift towards a more traditional clan-like outlook, it would not begin as anyone thought. A new, unseen predator appeared in the oceans of Stranomecti, a creature that after its first sightings earned it the title Diamond Shark. This monster tore through a sea fox right before the very eyes of Con Damon Clark and his entourage as they came to give offering to the totem animal of their clan. Seeing this take place, Damon knew the path forwards for his clan. They would pivot from being the nimble, cunning sea fox and become the superior warrior that was the Diamond Shark. There were procedures to make such an adjustment, however, because there would need to be recognition and acceptance from the other clans. In a meeting called before the Great Council, Clark made his case for the changing of the name, claiming that while Nicholas Kerensky's wisdom was for them to be named for this animal, he never saw the Diamond Shark and its power and claimed clearly that this creature had to have been genetically superior. Standing against this attempt to take their clan in a new direction, more than any other clan, was Clan Snow Raven. This would be the beginning of a long rivalry between these two powers, as, during the argument on the council chamber floor, Con Howell of Clan Snow Raven revealed that they had engineered the Diamond Shark and unleashed it upon Stranomecti, in secret to drive the sea foxes into extinction, all to punish the clan named for the animal for their deviations from the true path, amongst other transgressions. Regardless of their feelings towards the sea foxes, this was seen as an affront, and not just to the clan, which was the target of their ire, but by Sakon Nima Sukhanov, of Clan Snow Raven no less. What Howl had done was a slight to the vision of Kerensky, destroying an animal he viewed as worthy of being a totem for one of his clans. In the midst of his argument, he was shut down by his second-in-command, who immediately issued a trial of grievance against him 
for his unclan-like activities, Howell would be killed in the trial by his own second-in-command for his hand in all of this shortly after accepting the challenge. The vote to change the clan's name failed. But upon a trial of refusal, the more than capable military leader, Con Clark, would annihilate the Snow Raven forces that rose to oppose him, winning the clan's right to change their totem animal regardless. A referendum was needed inside of the clan, too, as it was impossible to take such an action without their consent. Originally, the hardliner Khan only wanted the warriors to vote, and as a branch offered to the other castes to win some of their support for his rule, he allowed all of the clan's castes to vote. The motion passed, if only barely, and what had been Sea Fox became Diamond Shark in 2985. From this point on, for decades, the clan would become more warrior-centric. With time, they would even become more crusader-like, albeit due to two misguided beliefs. One of those beliefs was that they could temper the other crusaders. The other belief was that Clan Diamond Shark was an echo of the idea of the old Star League, and upon its restoration, they could truly liberate the people of the Inner Sphere and help them return to a life they would enjoy, under the Diamond Shark's tutelage, of course. In reality, though, their own culture, leaning towards the Crusader cause, was what changed. In 3046, the lower castes were brought into full servitude by the newly elected Con Ian Hawker, who did not soften in his conservative approach as his predecessor Clark had, stripping the lower castes of their influence. Freeborn warriors, too, were caught up in all of this, and forced exclusively into provincial galaxy clusters, where, I might add, they had the opportunity to pilot the mighty Warhammer 2C, though not with much prestige attached to it. Much to the dismay of the Diamond Sharks, however, they would not succeed in becoming a frontline invasion clan, though some of the Sharks did use the situation to their advantage. Despite not officially being in the operation, and becoming in essence a reserve clan, they provided logistical support and had their merchants embark on trading operations within the newly conquered territories, exploiting these fresh markets on the comparatively rich and established worlds of the conquered states, supplying clan garrisons and cutting deals where they could. These acts of self-indulgence, as they were viewed by other clans, would eventually earn the ire of the Smoke Jaguars and the Ilkhan, Leo Showers. But it did not come to a full head, as the Sharks demanded their own merchants return home after issues kept coming up, including ones where trade was happening potentially with the enemy. Merchant Cast attempted to defy Con Hawker's orders, and tried to continue their activities, bringing the wrath of their own warriors upon them. This reinforcing of who was in charge, and who was not, created more enemies for Hawker outside of the warrior caste but he naturally did not need to cater to these people. So why would he? Well, unfortunately for him and his rule, which was already earning ire from the civilian sex, Hawker would have been wise to see some of the knives being sharpened in some corners of the clan, even if he was too powerful to be struck at. Yet. The problem for Hawker, and his supporters regrettably, was they lacked such insight to be concerned. Voting for Ulrich Kerensky to be Ilkhan after Leo Schauer's unfortunate death would earn his clan a single world in the inner sphere from Clan Ghost Bear, and gave them hope that they would be fully activated as a reserve clan. When the call to Tukia took place in 3052, only a single cluster was left on their staging world. Con Hawker committed every other Diamond Shark unit at his disposal to this vital battle. It was here, against the Comguards, that Diamond Shark only survived as a clan due to its free birth warriors, and due to its second line machines. The battle went wrong at every turn for the Diamond Sharks, 
Many will know from more tactical situations. When facing a strong enemy, splitting one's forces, especially on the attack, can result in defeat, which is made all the more likely when you have a lack of tactical surprise. Another ill omen was that there were divisions inside of the sharks from the start too, with Omega Galaxy being mistreated openly by their cons. The mech warriors in this formation, many of them freebirths, were ordered to join the laborers when working on field constructions after making landfall, as well as unloading weapons and equipment from their dropships. Alpha and Gamma Galaxies, which were entirely made up of Trueborn Warriors, were there to claim all the glory of the assault. Nothing would be shared with the Freebirths, or at least, that was the plan. Their opponents, the military wing of Comstar, also proved to be more cunning than they gave them credit for, because they did not oppose the arrival of the Diamond Sharks, who were landing in a rocky area with higher ground. The Sharks would strike out from this defensible position through more open ground, moving through the Kuzis Valley and the river network around it. Their objectives, two towns, Ukunat and Kuzis Prime, were achievable objectives in theory. The two blows on the settlement were to happen at the same time, and were projected internally to overwhelm the Comguards by driving them into a rout. It was to be a lightning attack, ending with the occupation of both towns in short order. There was another problem for the clan forces too. Logistics were a mess throughout the opening of the shark's attack, with the freeborn mech warriors being forced into technician and labor jobs they didn't fully understand. Preparing their positions and supply point was just not working to their timetable. Hawker ordered some elementals to assist them, but gave them the order to, quote, kill any Stravog, unquote, who were holding back his grand plans. It even led to the deaths of three freeborn mech warriors, who asked questions out of turn, limiting the number of combatants Omega Galaxy possessed, foolishly. Because of the delays, and because of other issues, Hawker ordered the assault prematurely, realizing his window of attack was closing. Comstar, with mismanagement of time on their enemy's side, took up ideal positions. Prior to the assault by the Sharks, they had also concealed forward observers to monitor every move their enemies made. It was a massacre when Ian Hawker's attack began, almost as he'd planned. Only it was his forces that bled, instead of the Comguards. For four days, the Sharks were battered as they were cut off and encircled. Gamma and Alpha Galaxies were immediately pinned down, and were whittled away by severe incoming fire from the ring around them. With no option left, and with reluctance and anger in his voice, he demanded his position be relieved by none other than the Freebirths of Omega Galaxy. It would be these Freebirths, with their Warhammer 2Cs and other machines, that pulled off a miracle and saved the last shreds of the Diamond Shark Tumen. Instead of refusing their orders, after the humiliation and abuse heaped upon them by their con, Omega Galaxy assaulted the Comguard forces that had ringed around their supposed comrades. This rescue operation led to intense fighting. Machines like the Marauder 2C, Warhammer 2C, and a multitude of others sent devastating fire downrange, which could not be matched by the Blakists they fought. Such was the ferocity of this inferno, that a fracture broke in the encirclement's outer edges, giving a sliver of hope for those within. Unfortunately, given his role in this disaster, Conhawker would be amongst the mech warriors who would make it through the breach. Between enemy fire on those trying to disengage from the battle, and so many being pinned down, only Hawker, his Sawcon Sinet, and just four other battle mechs would make it through this opening. The fighting then turned to the landing zone next, where Omega Galaxy bravely fought on, the formation taking battering impacts from the Conguard in turn as their full fury rounded upon them. 
the remnants of Alpha and Gamma staggered onto the dropships, while Omega Galaxy, knowing if they slipped for one moment, knowing if they gave the comm guards an inch, none would leave Tukiid outside of captivity, refused their orders to board their dropships, and fought to the last mech, trading their lives for time. Warhammer 2 sees, some of ancient make, as if mirroring their spheroid counterparts, with their freeborn pilots, fought until their barrels melted, before being shattered by autocannon and missile fire, as the last dropships departed to safety. Tukid was so disastrous, it changed the makeup and shape of Clan Diamond Shark forever. The Trueborn Warriors, the base of political support who Ian Hawker relied on to maintain his conship, were almost entirely eliminated in the battle by the Comguards. Forces which had been gently suppressed, and then overtly oppressed, since the time of the shift from Sea Fox to Diamond Shark, showed their sharpened blades politically. Hawker was forced to lift the barring of Freebirth warriors from frontline galaxies, due to the bravery of those in the second line, who had piloted traditional mechs, and had saved his life. As an aside, Ian Hawker did not think much of those who saved him, offering them little in the way of praise, even as they fought to the death to ensure some Diamond Sharks escaped Tukiid. As many of you can probably already assume, the real reason for the change was pitifully, and simply, that most of the Trueborn Warriors in the clan were, in fact, dead with the complete destruction of two of their frontline galaxies. In order to survive as a clan, they needed the Freebirths. And even a fool like Con Ian Hawker saw it. Diamond Shark, bleeding as it was, returned to the clan homeworlds after another shameful defeat, this time at the hands of Clan Ghost Bear. Had other events not occupied the clans for several years following Tukiid, the Diamond Shark's days would have been numbered feigning that their wounds were not as severe as they were, and playing coyly as if they were the sea foxes of old, rather than the bold sharks of the sea, they began their recovery, with such vast material losses from several mismanaged moves. The organization would turn to its traditional role, trade. In essence, this came about because of the weakness of the Khan's leadership and situation. Embattled and unpopular, but still too strong to be toppled, Khan Ian Hawker became a Khan to no one, and his power and ability to influence the clan he was responsible for leading dwindled after the disasters he oversaw. Effective control of most of the clan's remaining functionality fell into the hands of Angus Leboeuf, a retired warrior who had entered the merchant caste and became head of the clan's merchant council. They once more became an economic juggernaut, as their merchant caste was more or less unleashed from the reins of control. As the clans themselves became too preoccupied with other crises from the invasion and destruction of Clan Smoke Jaguar to intervene, they functionally began to issue orders to the warrior caste of Clan Diamond Shark too, not the other way around. The warrior caste more or less became hired muscle their protection, as it were. Whether that come in the form of warships and their crews, battle mechs and their pilots, or elementals. Huge profit margins were made in both the clan homeworlds and in the invasion corridor. Lebov had bridged the gap between merchant and warrior, allowing both to prosper as the Tumen was rebuilt. But make no mistake, the warriors of Clan Diamond Shark were removed from functional power by a coup and remade into the merchant's creatures. As time moved forward from this point, perhaps it could be said there was even a union of the two, but it was the merchant's way by and large that dominated the clan society. There would be resistance to this capture, but wounded as they were, and with the power having shifted to the merchants, it was nothing but impotent flailing in the jaws of the predatory merchant caste. Like a shapeshifter from then on, when it was convenient to be clan warriors, they were. When it was inconvenient, they were not. 
Regardless of this prosperity, however, the freeborn warriors and merchants were not the only ones to thrive in these new uncharted waters. Their industries did as well. The other clans, either preparing for war with one another, or fighting in desperation against the great houses and other organizations, needed military hardware. Weaponry was in high demand, making it a seller's market. And while their facilities were running at full pace to replace their own military assets, the surplus, which only grew with time, could be traded at a premium with their clan counterparts. But why sell the highest quality, highest value battle mechs to your clan friends, who may want to harm you in the future anyway? Omnimex are versatile enough that they may come up with their own configurations with time, and it might be a problem to sell them large numbers without strings, especially if there are contract disputes. Without a doubt, the Diamond Sharks would sell Omnimex, but at a great cost. But why not sell these clan clients on an older, reliable design that you know the ins and outs of? Why bother buying machines like the Warhammer 2C from Clan Star Adder and then resell them to other clans when you can just win the right to manufacture them yourself and flood the market? There were clearly a lot of questions that Clan Diamond Shark asked in 3060. After the impressive display of the Warhammer 2C during the latter portion of the Clan Invasion era, and after their own Freeborn Warriors proved themselves multiple times, not only would the Sharks see value in their own domestic military consumption, but they saw value in the mech and more in redistributing them to far more in-need clients. In the build-up to the conflicts across human space, even though the other clans looked down upon the Diamond Sharks with distrust and sometimes even disdain, they needed what they had on offer, and they would pay the price. Manufacturing Plant DSF-12, a Diamond Shark facility on the world of Paxson, became the new home for the manufacturing of the Warhammer 2C in its various configurations for its various buyers during the mid-31st century. Production of these units, for the clans, and for the industrial base available, was more than significant. Indeed, they would manufacture them in such numbers and arrays of configurations that these monstrous assault mechs began to appear in a variety of their forms across the entirety of every active clan, whether they be in the homeworlds or the inner sphere. With changes that had started to happen in the clan ways of war too, and just the economic realities of it, especially after the pressure of the clan invasion, the Warhammer 2C would begin to be even seen outside of simple garrison clusters, and started to appear in other galaxies with a degree of frequency for the first time since the widespread adoption of the Omnimech. The Sharks had their role to play in all of this as we just discussed. Of course, even selling their new configurations to the originators of the mech, Clan Star Adder, However, just as much as it had to do with the fact that these machines had been undervalued for so long, the Warhammer 2C was easy to maintain, had readily available parts, didn't require an expensive XL engine typically, and was a fearsome fighter on the battlefield. The mech was very effective against the Inner Sphere, which often banked on exploiting Clan XL chassis in ambushes, trying to cripple them by dehabilitating their engines as early as they possibly could in a fight. It had every virtue needed to succeed against the Inner Sphere, and even against the clans. In total, Clan Diamond Shark, later to be named Clan Seafox once more around the turn of the century, would be responsible for a huge volume of the Warhammer 2C's vast number of variants. And at a certain point, they did something the other clans could only see as treasonous, and it would have grave consequences, because they began playing a most dangerous game, selling them to the Inner Sphere.
perhaps the least well-received Warhammer adaptation created during the 31st century, and originally produced for both internal use and export to other clans. The Warhammer 2C3 was the first Diamond Shark configuration of the mech to walk off the assembly line on plant DSF-12, and did so in 3060. The mech, first exported to clans Cloud Cobra, Star Adder, and Ghost Bear, mostly reconfigured its weapons, tonnage, and heat sink totals in order to try to become a powerful heavy laser mech. As with a large number of heavy laser design-based mechs, the costs outweigh the benefits in many ways, at least in the opinion of the pilots who took to its controls. The primary differences in the core frame are simple. It has 22 double heat sinks instead of 20, to help compensate for the additional heat burden of its new offensive package. Then it has 12.5 tons of plating instead of 12. This bumps its armored protection up by 10 points, which is not dramatically more than the chassis had before, but it is extra protection all the same. Things then go over to its other more offensive options. To begin with, it has a targeting computer on board, making the mech as a whole more accurate, which is definitely needed given its main attack options. For its primary armaments, it has a pair of heavy large lasers, replacing the traditional PPCs but these generate 18 points of heat each, while dealing 16 points of damage. They only weigh 4 tons though, but the heat generated from these is so severe that it is hard to reasonably justify in many cases. Then, when combined with the fact that they have a negative 1 penalty to hit, and they have a range of only 15 hexes, they feel like inferior replacements to the clan ER PPCs that were on board. These are the main reason for the targeting system being installed too, and for the extra cooling that was added. Ironically, more tonnage is spent trying to make these worthwhile than the difference between just installing regular clan ER PPCs instead. After this, it has five medium pulse lasers, the same as the original. It's largely an upgrade they didn't need, but it does enhance them. And with these deadly accurate lasers, they make up the lion's share of the mech's real offensive power, mirroring the original in this sense. Overall, the Warhammer 2C3 does live up to its lackluster reputation. Not that it's bad, but it's just that it has more limitations than many of the other Warhammer 2C configurations it's compared with. It runs hotter, it lacks scatter damage, and its range is more limited. Still, it's deadly accurate, even more so with its upgraded pulse lasers. And it lacks any ammunition on board to cause catastrophic ammunition explosions, meaning it is a more rugged mech, and therefore harder to knock out overall. It is easy to see why clan warriors had a preference for other Warhammer 2C variants, but this beast is still not without its virtues, in other words. If it gets in close, it might just finish off whoever was foolish enough to have allowed that to have happened. The most prominent configuration of the Warhammer 2C built in the 31st century by Clan Diamond Shark, the Warhammer 2C4, followed in the footsteps of the Warhammer 2C3, with lessons learned after feedback from both their own mech warriors and clients. The 2C4 was a big win for the Sea Foxes in terms of following up on the success of the original Star Adder design. In this instance, they not only took the original configuration and revamped its weapons loadout, but did a complete rebuild of the mech's internal systems as well. New guidance systems, electronics, and modern upgrades of older Clantech weaponry were installed into the mech to ensure optimal operations for both the mech warriors within and the technicians who needed to service it. These quality of life improvements may not appear in game, but they showed the operators of the mech in-universe with these small features that they weren't just buying an old mech with a proverbial new coat of paint on it. So successful was this new iteration of the Warhammer 2C, even Clan Star Adder would begin procuring them from Clan Diamond Shark. In terms of its core features, it mirrored the 2C's base model to a team. It has the same heat sinks, armor, internal structure, and engine, 
Where things differ, much like the 3, is mostly in the offensive package. Retaining its ERPPCs, unlike the unloved Warhammer 2C3, the 2C4 is a threat at any range to enemy combatants. Where things differ after this, is in its removal of the traditional pulse lasers, in favor of twin ATM-6 launchers. These advanced tactical missile systems, with one in each side torso, launch barrages of missiles at different qualities, out to different ranges, providing different damage results. These are exceptionally powerful, and many would in fact argue they are the best missile system in the setting. It then goes on to install five tons of ammunition, giving it either supreme long-term sustainability on the battlefield, or letting the 2C4 install every missile type it could want for every situation, to have maximum impact on its opponents. To conclude this list, it has an ER small laser mounted in the head. The 2C4 is flexible, deals hellish damage at all range brackets, especially when its ATMs are able to draw from ammunition for different range brackets and it doesn't even run hot doing it. Better yet, it still has all the durability and other virtues of the base Warhammer 2C. Its popularity is no accident. It is time to take our rightful place as the leaders of a new enlightened time and to teach them all the price of opposition, the price of blood, the price of honorless death, the price the blood spirit shall taste. The Remembrance, Clan Star Adder, Passage 214, Verse 1, Lines 1 through 8. While the sharks played their hand in the inner sphere, a great serpent was beginning to awaken in the homeworlds. Clan Staradder, the father of the Warhammer 2C, would soon have its own journey come to a close within the setting as we know it. While the Warhammer 2C has a role to play here too, in this most desperate of times in destruction, this part of the overview is intended to honor the clan that brought this mech into the world by divulging the last known information about it, and to see a sliver of the insanity that was the Wars of Reaving. The chaos born of Operation Revival created opportunities for Clan Star Adder to exploit in ways that it could not have or would not have indulged in before. After their gracious recommendations prior to the attack on the Inner Sphere, which were rebuffed, the Adders patiently coiled inwards, drawing in their strength, and preparing to strike. As others wasted their power and allowed it to dwindle on foolhardy errands and tasks, they would be the ones to come to the forefront of the clans, slithering around them in an ever tighter embrace. The Adders, even with their ascending power, were always a recluse amongst the Grand Council of the clans. This general policy was abandoned in the wake of Operation Revival, as they prepared to assert their influence as never before. Clan Star Adder was traditionally too self-absorbed in their own empire building, and often too wrapped up in their own Machiavellian internal politics to get too deeply attached to other clans beyond confrontations with them. While they had been crusaders, they hardly were at the forefront of the crusader thought even. It's ironic that they expected unity from the other clans, when internally, at a leadership level, the Adders were double dealers in the same way that the Snow Ravens often were. Allegedly, that is. Nevertheless, with the other clans distraught by the huge shift in power and resources happening due to revival, and the ongoing destruction of Clan Smoke Jaguar, they would begin the real founding portion of their own schemes. Fortune would favor them, when in 3059, Clan Barak became implicated in assisting the nefarious Darkcast. 
a trial of absorption would be approved by the Grand Council of the Clans, and through their positioning and demeanor, Star Adder were the ones selected to carry out the trial against them. With the resources of another clan in their clutches, the mighty Star Serpent would have yet another glittering scale on its already impressive hide. The task found its way into the Star Adder's hands in the first place, because they were far stronger than any other homeworld clan after the splitting of resources for the invasion, and because it was felt that they could put together the wreckage of what had been Clan Burrock more appropriately after the fact. This decision had the unintended consequences of driving the Blood Spirits, another clan, wild with jealousy and envy. They despised Clan Burrock and now Clan Star Adder as well. The Burrocks were theirs to take, not the snakes. The spirits would make sure the trial was theirs to win, no matter what the council decided. Defying the judgment placed down upon the Burrocks, as the bloody trial took place, the spirits launched their attack on both clans. They'd been hiding parts of their assets for years, with the help of Clan Snowraven, and were now ready to humble Star Adder and crush Clan Burrock. The spirits assumed that in their assault, their enemies would simply continue to fight one another, as they guessed the greedy snakes would not give up their prize and would stay the course. What they'd not taken into account was that Clan Burrock's grievances with Blood Spirit at the time far outweighed their grievances with Clan Star Adder, despite the trial of absorption. In the savage fighting that followed, Multiple galaxies from across Clan Star Adder were pulled into the furnace of combat. From their first and second lines, as the onslaught from the spirits lashed out on multiple worlds. Once more, mechs like the Warhammer 2C proved their worth, and later displayed their value doubly so, in the next two assaults against Clan Blood Spirit. In the short term, the rage from the Blood Spirits cost Star Adder three galaxies worth of equipment and personnel. Their transaction was more than paid in return, however, with the Blood Spirit Tumen being torn apart, as five full galaxies of their troops were killed during the fighting. The miscalculation on behalf of the Spirits due to, ironically, their greed, arrogance, hubris, and vindictiveness was their undoing. These faults were some of the very traits they ascribed to their enemies, in fact. Even when catching the Star Adders by surprise, interceding at the right moment with a bold plan, they were undone by them, as the Snakes realized they could turn the situation to their own advantage, taking on Burrock's territories with even less resistance all while using their once enemy forces to blunt the Blood Spirit's ambitions. As stated prior, the Burrocks would rather kill Blood Spirits than Star Adders, and so the three-way battle the enemy had anticipated never manifested. Breaking the Blood Spirits back and absorbing Clan Burrock put Clan Star Adder on a trajectory of domination, just as they had planned. The scale of the bloodletting, though, on the now two sides, cemented the disdain between the two clans after the fact, and there would be a reckoning. In a cunning move in the aftermath of this clash, Khan Nabuta honored the same treaties Barak once had, beginning to build even more trust with Clan Cloud Cobra as a result, even if it put his recovering clan at risk. The truth was, no clan was in much of a position to make war on them anyway, or they all had other interests at the time, especially as Clan Smoke Jaguar's death followed only months later. In the aftermath of the Great Refusal, a peace treaty between the Inner Sphere and the clans, their movements started to become clear. Star Adder began taking enclaves as others squabbled on multiple worlds. As the bickering clans wore one another down in their bids to take abandoned planets left behind by clans Ghost Bear, Nova Cat, Smoke Jaguar, and gradually other invasion clans, it would be Star Adder, more often than not,
taking possession of these holdings after their enemies in the Kerensky Cluster bloodied themselves first. Still, this was all a precursor to the first massive blow against their chosen enemy, Clan Blood Spirit. The war over York was a key turning point in the homeworlds of the clans. This was indeed an act of revenge on behalf of Clan Star Adder towards their Blood Spirit rivals for their transgressions against the magnificent Snake Clan. Beyond just their venomous disdain for the Blood Spirits, there were internal political considerations behind the attack for the Adders aside from revenge. This seeming crusade was also done in order to prove to their new Burak warriors that they were serious about retaining and working with them inside of their clan. As discontent had appeared on the horizon with these recently absorbed populations, the operation would happen in stages and would be part of a multi-year protracted conflict over the world, and one where the spirits would be unwillingly and truthfully unable to step back from it. The Warhammer 2C played such a prominent role in this conflict between these two now hated rivals that it was specifically referenced when addressing the battle through several sources. These focus on specifically the use of the Warhammer 2C4. These mechs, procured from Clan Diamond Shark rather than their own domestic stock of the original Warhammer 2C, were used in some numbers during the campaign. The irony would be only a handful of years later, these very same Warhammers would be turned on their creators, unbeknownst to the merchant Junta, which had seized the Diamond Sharks. The Star Adder reasoning behind their use, and the use of large numbers of other second-line mechs for the assault on York, was easy to see. Not only were these mechs generally less expensive to operate and manage, not only was it wise just to use second-line mechs as needed in more advanced formations, but it was also to strike against the Blood Spirit's inflated ego. It goaded them, with the overt disrespect Clan Star Adder now showed them. They were only worthy of fighting the Adder's second line. The Blood Spirits prided themselves on somehow being the best warriors amongst the clans. Fiercely trained and dedicated to their craft, they embodied all of the follies of the clan way of warfare. York, the Blood Spirit's capital world, would be in truth, years before the declaration by Brett Andrews of Clan Steel Viper, the opening portion of the nightmare that was the Wars of Reaving, even if it was left unsaid at this point. The fight on this world was savage, and often without quarter or honor. With their backs to the wall, the Blood Spirits would do all that they could to resist the furious serpent they had awakened. Blood Spirit Omnimechs were batted aside by the Star Adder's second line formations, more than frequently led by Warhammer 2C4s. Whereas Omnimex under ideal logistic situations can be powerful in their own respects, when expensive mechs are captured or otherwise irretrievably lost, it is nothing but an enormous detriment to their operators. For the Star Adders, they could pay the cost of attrition on world, even affording to lose the hulking behemoths they had first designed in 2829. The series of victories these titans led against their supposedly technologically superior counterparts did something fundamentally important in the clans as a whole. Each time these monsters slew and laid waste to the fabled Omnimex, and then drove the blood spirits back in these series of hellish engagements, despite the Adder's own comparable losses, they chipped away at the mythology the clan warrior cast had built around the Omnimech, and they did so in front of all of the clans. Reports flowed out across the Kerensky Cluster of the cataclysmic Battle of York, where all but a few clans still resided to some extent, beginning to dispel the mania that had taken hold of their military thinking for hundreds of years. In its own way, this was a reflection on the past, the righting of a wrong that should have never taken place, as it was here, on York, centuries after the Star Adder's failure to defend itself from Clan Mongoose, centuries after the Warhammer 2C and its pilots were scattered before the supposed 
next step in battle mech evolution. It was now these machines, some of them surviving battle mechs from the very campaigns of the past, that broke the sword of an Omnimech-led defense. York would not be completely lost, as the Blood Spirits, desperately clinging to the last shreds of their honor, would strike at other Star Outer holdings with their reserve forces, such as Tathis and even Arcadia, in an attempt to draw their attention elsewhere, as well as, of course, to disrupt their supply lines. Regardless, it would be the image of the Warhammer 2C, standing tall over the shattered and mangled mechs that would be remembered in the histories. The wars and raids between the Blood Spirits and Star Adders would last into the 3070s, with calamitous consequences, because the Blood Spirits would fasten themselves to their homeworld York with grim determination, until the very end. The opening of hostilities inspired many other clans to begin making their own plays for other worlds, especially as clan space had so much territory and potential resources vacated, and without the major powers present there in full, before a title could be given to this terrible era, these years of carnage and chaos, more would need to suffer, as this was only the very start of the hell that was to be unleashed. This sham of a league was proven to have no honor. We as the clans have finally come as one in understanding this. There is no righteous way to lead, none since our founder and great father left the tatters of the true Star League over 300 years and countless warrior generations past. It is our duty to step beyond ourselves and finally fulfill the destiny that we started 22 years ago. In order to redeem the inner sphere from its corruption and taint, it requires that we ourselves be of purity. Only without taint can we remove the iniquity that so poisons the inner sphere, a poison that began to spread after the Great Father started our founders upon their journey. Putting the clans into position requires extreme measures. We must remove the taint that has beset us, much as it beset our wayward brethren in the Pentagon worlds so many generations ago. Reaving our impurities is the only answer. Con, Brett Andrews. Reflections on the Way of Kerensky. December 31st, 3072. Instability had been the watchword of the homeworld clans over the course of the 3060s. Petty squabbles, crises born of the power vacuum left behind by the invasion, jealousy and envy of the clans in the invasion corridor, hidden migrations, massive military clashes, even involving warships, and a resentment of the inner sphere and its people, all characterized the nightmarish time for the people of the Kerensky Cluster and the Pentagon Worlds. During this storm of discord, the Grand Council of the Clans could not even agree on the most basic of things, nor could it clear the instability by electing a new Ilkhan in order to provide guidance to their people. At least, not yet. Clans Diamond Shark, Snow Raven, and Hell's Horses functionally joined the Inner Sphere at this time splitting their assets between the two. Icelian attempted to partake in this migration, but would be repulsed and cast once more back towards the homeworlds. Even Star Adder explored the outer reaches of the periphery, attempting to discover by what method the clans had found to make their way to the inner sphere, through alternative routes. By 3070, things began to degrade at an accelerated pace. Clan Steel Viper's cons, seemingly having gone mad with the idea of purification, and infecting others who had mostly missed out on their opportunity to invade the Inner Sphere, as well as seeing how the invading clans had changed, such as their liberal use of Desgra tactics, began turning on those who were infected with the evolutions they'd suffered while in the Inner Sphere. The most obvious first targets, beyond any others, 
were Clan Jade Falcon, who would be blitzed by the Steel Vipers and functionally annihilated from the Clan Homeworlds in short order, as their divided force faced the full wrath of the Vipers. And during all of this, the Snake Alliance began to form. Clans Star Adder and Cloud Cobra had been allies for some time now, and the Cobras, realizing the failure of the invasion and the collapse of their own plans in recent years, had tied their fate to the more powerful Clan Star Adder. The Adders, under Khan Stanislav Nabuta, viewed the third and newest member of this alliance, Clan Steel Viper, as political tools. These three were allies, without a doubt, but competitors all the same. Even working against one another as both Star Adder and Steel Viper tried to earn the right to crush and absorb the weakened and divided Clan Snow Raven. Away from the Council, the three clans could simply take what they wanted from the Ravens, without consulting the other clans, thrusting their attacks into the now mistrusted and shamed clan, a clan that had recently enacted orbital bombardments of civilians in the inner sphere, killing billions, earning them contempt amongst the clan council. There was to be more discussion on the matter. However, the snakes had already decided without needing to hear from the others. And with two of the most powerful clans in the Kerensky cluster, the aforementioned Star Adder and Steel Viper, both being involved, the Snow Raven's chances of survival in these competitions were abysmal from the start. As a result of these attacks, the Ravens lost most of their enclaves and perilously needed to buy time to uproot what was left of their clan and make flight for the Inner Sphere. Only through the convenient discovery of the shameful actions by Clan Diamond Shark to sell clan technologies to the Inner Sphere were they able to purchase the prior mentioned time for themselves even as the fighting still raged in all of their traditional holdings. While the Clan Council failed to come to a consensus on what to do about the Diamond Sharks and their treasonous activity, the Snake Alliance certainly did find their own, and in a wave of contempt, they would redirect their attacks towards the Diamond Sharks, who would now find themselves in as precarious a situation as their Raven rivals. In spite of early successes by the Snake Alliance against the Sharks, the Adders would take several enclaves and then simply halt, turning their own attentions once more to the Spirits. Frustrated with their allies abandoning them, the Vipers pressed on and engaged in a brutal and bloody war with the Diamond Sharks. Things devolved quickly into warship-centric combat, where the Steel Vipers gained the edge over the two divided clans, scattering their fleets. With their supposed ally battering the Sharks and Ravens, Clan Star Adder had a more significant war to wage. Clans Fire Mandrel and Blood Spirit had been causing them problems, making attacks against them where they could, and in response, the Star Adders turned their full attention to these nuisances. On Circe, Three full galaxies of blood spirits were caught and exposed as the Star Adders arrived, declaring a trial of possession. The spirits had hoped for a protracted respite, and instead found themselves at the mercy of a full planetary assault by the Celestial Snakes. Remnants of Clan Snow Raven as well would be caught up in this ferocious attack, being destroyed in the hurricane of violence that followed. Blood Asps, Baroks, and Warhammer 2 Cs ground their opponents into dust on the surface of this former Snow Raven stronghold, as the unstoppable Star Adder formation moved from target to target. Even when Clan Fire Mandrel arrived, squabbling with their theoretical allies the Blood Spirits before deploying to the world, they were left helpless in the intense assault as well. The Blood Spirits attempted to gain the advantage by abandoning Zelbringen. In the later stages of the disaster, claiming the Star Adders lacked honor, though this only made the situation yet worse. Once honorable combat was put aside, the Star Adders were allowed to exercise their full fury without restraint. Khan Schmidt of Blood Spirit, after losing two thirds of her forces, 
asked for Hegera, or honorable surrender. The Star Adders denied the request and pressed forwards. Only a handful of Blood Spirit and Fire Mandrel ships would escape the wrath of the Titanic Snake and its powerful battle mechs. Once more, Star Adder asserted themselves, and did so with powerful battle mech forces, including their true war machine of a prior age. A mech finding its value once more as the situation in the homeworlds of the clans grew worse. The Warhammer 2C. Every clan bled during this time. Every clan vied for power. Every clan prepared their own escape. Or their own triumph. But it was in 3070 that a nuclear strike would hit Tamar in the Inner Sphere, doing severe damage to Clan Wolf in its occupation zone, including to their genetic legacies. The Adders, in response to this outrage, would call for an Ilkhan to be elected once more. The turmoil and destruction had to be resolved, as something dark and sinister was afoot in the Inner Sphere, and they would need unity and direction, regardless of the recent years of bitter struggle and violence, to meet it. Whoever came to power would be from the Snake Alliance, or at least that is what Khan Nabuta assumed. Sadly for the clans, and seemingly against all odds, the very opposite to victory for the Snake Alliance took place. Instead of Stanislav of Star Adder becoming Ilkhan, Khan Garrett Sains of Clan Fire Mandrel, a man who could barely control his own clan, was elected. He won by one vote, purely on behalf of the other clans wanting to avoid giving the Snake Alliance any more power. Ilkhan Sains immediately put the great refusal on the table to be revoked, and that was the most popular proposal that he could table. The vote would bizarrely fail, putting his Ilkhan ship in the very first day into crisis. The Snake Alliance, led by Star Adder, abstained from the vote, causing the failure. Immediately, Sains was declared an incompetent and was accused of being unfit to lead the clans by Khan Ariel Suvorov of Clan Goliath Scorpion, and a trial of refusal was issued against him and his position. How can we be led by this man if we cannot even accord him respect here in this chamber? Not once did he lift a finger to end this political circus and move us to the business of war. Sains was unsurprisingly killed in the trial only a handful of days later, ending his pitifully short reign. There are assertions, and not unfound ones, that Clan Staradder arranged this trial, especially given that the Scorpions would benefit from acquiring Staradder holdings. Only a few weeks later, through very lax trials, the council, naturally, fell into squabbling and bickering once more. What happened next was almost comical. On April 15th, 3071, the wolves were officially abjured, leading to more outrage as Con Vlad Ward, who was present for the declaration of functional exile, snapped back at the council, referring to them as a, quote, limp-spined parody of a council. Chaos spread once more as enclaves were taken, and violence broke out and not only with the retreating wolves, but between the clans themselves, finding an excuse in the chaos to grab yet more power. The clan council would meet again on December 1st, 3071, to once more attempt to elect an Ilkhan to bring about change to the clans during the bleakest assault on the Inner Sphere, as well as to resolve the anarchy and discord that had only become progressively worse in their own territories. Now there were only two valid options, and Stanislav Nubuta, one of those options, reneged on the opportunity. The Snake Alliance would have their throne, and it would be one of the most infamous men in history Con Brett Andrews, who would take this seeming trophy for the Alliance. He 
became Ilkhan. Brett Andrews' hatred of the Inner Sphere and its corrupting influence was by now unending and near legendary. In fact, as Ilkhan, he would immediately label any legacies or blood names from the clans that resided within the Inner Sphere as tainted and corrupt. They lack the purity of honor necessary to deserve to take Terra and complete the Great Father's dream. As such, the tainted legacies and any warriors created from them will be subject to trials of reaving to be executed by honorable clans deemed free of the taint. Ilkhan, Brett Andrews, December 1st, 3071. Even Khan Nabuta seemed to realize the gravity of the error in making Andrews the Ilkhan, as more and more clans abandoned the Grand Council. Once more, unity had not been achieved. Blood names of almost all of the Inner Shur clans were put on a list of names to be reaved with haste. Angus LeBeouf, the innovative father of Clan Diamond Shark in its new form, the man who'd saved his clan and expanded its power, even with the loss of his own holdings in clan space, would denounce Andrews and his ideas in the council. And he would be reaved immediately by Brent Andrews, who slew him with a ceremonial knife, throwing it into his neck as soon as the trial had been agreed to. Labov and his long-standing life championing his caste and his clan died an unworthy death while bleeding out on the chamber floors. What was now dubbed the Wars of Reaving had already been happening for years, as demonstrated here in this overview, but now it finished evolving into the ugly nightmare all should have feared. The terror unleashed by Brett Andrews had only just begun. The destruction of the Kerensky Blood Chapel in the fighting against the last remnants of Clan Wolf in the home worlds would be a part of this dark beginning. Fighting broke out in the capital as attempts were made to reave the last of the Jade Falcons and Ghost Bears on world, their lore masters only escaping by fortune alone. Orbital bombardments gone wrong would see the capital of the clans themselves, Katusha City, burn and the frenzy that had been ignited by the Ilkhan. In the Inferno, even the present civilians of Ghost Bear, Hell's Horses, Wolf, Snow Raven, Diamond Shark, and Jade Falcon were reaved. Blood flowed like a river in the madness as fighting devolved into acts of barbarity. Even anti-infantry battle mechs like the Piranha were unleashed disgracefully on civilian populations in this bloodlust. Amid this maelstrom of malice and misfortune, Clan Blood Spirit took advantage of the chaos and assaulted the Star Adder Enclave on Stranomechni, more intent on getting even than following Brett Andrews' ideas. In the violence and confusion, they killed Sakon Dante Truscott as he was protecting Star Adder civilians in the onslaught. This was likely the most foolish move the spirits would ever make as the grudge would now never be relinquished. The purging and reaving of blood names and whole warrior blood houses would continue across clan space as clan fought clan and their hunt for purity. The loss of life was horrendous, as was even how the homeworld clans treated one another as they became increasingly paranoid. The Star Adders in the middle of this carnage saw its Upsilon Galaxy, a unit made up of Clan Burok warriors and their descendants, vanish, having secluded itself away in defiance of its master, which it did not respect nor want any part of any longer. A new faction of scientists as well, the Society, had emerged too, seeking to overthrow the reckless warrior caste. Dark cast bandits also cropped up as clan space accelerated on its road to hell. The brigand attacks across this region of space were often repulsed, but due to communications failures, sabotage, and so much confusion, these strikes inevitably began damaging vital infrastructure. 
The society then intervened yet further, and even broadcast Astronomecti their intentions to throw off the chains which burdened the science cast for so long. The place Nicholas Kerensky founded, now finally, really had turned into a living nightmare. In its own way, perhaps it was more the mask that slipped, and the contradictions of its society simply couldn't be subdued any longer. But all that remained at this point was for even more of the tragedy of the Wars of Reefing to play out. Biological warfare was used by the society, who had mutated part of the clan's genetic legacies and tailored strains of viruses to hunt down and kill those who possessed the right genetic components. There was one fire that burned the brightest now, however, for Clan Star Adder had come for its revenge on Clan Blood Spirit, York, their home, a place the Star Adders had failed to take would be turned into a mass grave. The Adder's last enclave was evacuated as their fleet came to the planet, hanging in orbit menacingly. The specter of death loomed large on the now doomed world of York, a place that had seen intense fighting for over a decade. When the ships lifted off with their civilians and warriors, the blood spirits were left confused at first, which then grew into concern. Three days later, the bombardment began. An orbital, cataclysmic series of attacks followed, killing all but a handful of blood spirit warriors on planet, and simultaneously annihilating complex civilization on its surface. The Star Adders had determined that the clan blood spirit civilians were not able to be assimilated regardless, and the blood spirits, known for arming their non warrior castes, just made them more difficult to subdue. They had no need to engage in the charade any longer. Death came in the form of the celestial snakes above. The spirits had two hidden worlds which they'd been colonizing for some time, Honor and Haven. After the destruction of their first home, these would be the last major outcroppings for the remainder of their existence. But these colonies were incomplete, making their situation still yet more dire. In the same window of this slaughter, orders came from the Ilkhan that any dark caste or society assets were to be annihilated, along with any civilians who might be shielding them. The death toll from this proclamation and campaign were ruinous, and Clan Coyote would unofficially become one of its main targets. Everyone seemed to notice that the Coyotes had been captured by the society for all intents and purposes though they would be as a clan spared. Their scientists, however, would not. More viruses were released during all of this, killing multiple blood-named warriors and destroying hundreds of thousands of civilians as the clans worked to find solutions to these plagues. This also said nothing of their massacre of whole worlds, like Arcadia. The ravaged blood spirits began attempting to take their revenge, as the Adders began chasing after the shadows of what were Clan Burrock and their dark cast allies, especially as they lost mechs and materials to them in a predictable ambush. On the world of Eden, the Blood Spirits killed any Adders they found, with the torn up remaining shreds of their own military. They scoured any colonies they could for anything they could take as Isorla. York was a dying world, and their two colonies were in desperate need by this point. So the spirits, with the last of their combat-ready galaxies, went to Albion, after a failed venture to Arcadia. Here, Omicron and Omega Galaxies would find plenty to take, and they would have more than enough revenge to exact upon Star Adder civilians and warriors as well. Or at least so they thought. In the dying, half-abandoned enclaves of Albion, the fighting devolved into viciousness, despite the Blood Spirit's expectations of an easy fight. The provisional garrison clusters on world fought bitterly, once more armed with the infamous Second Line mechs, which had performed so well throughout the Wars of Reaving, battling back the Blood Spirits, who are now as dependent on protomechs as much as they were omnimechs for their tumen. The defending clusters had protected this world from the dark cast, and 
from the society for some time, and though their world had been damaged and depleted, they would still fight for it. Albion was to become another mass grave, sadly. Not only did the provisional garrison clusters fight with the desperation of hopelessness, with their backs to the wall in this raided and undone home, but the civilians armed themselves and fought alongside them, knowing their fate if they were defeated. Ironically, this mirrored the very behavior the blood spirits themselves normally adopted, but they were not prepared to face it themselves. Too eager for revenge, as well as too desperate for resources, the 98th Crimson Guards overextended their efforts and were cut off and destroyed, though at immense loss to civilians and garrison defenders. These were, for the Blood Spirits, losses that the clan could ill afford in comparison to their star adder enemies. Galaxy Commander Keller, the commanding officer, halted the advance to regroup and reorganize, and in doing so, left his forces open to a devastating airstrike, killing most of Omicron Galaxy's command trinary and the first Blood Cavalry cluster. To repay the Adders for their humiliation as they were forced to withdraw, the Blood Spirit warship, Exanguin, an Aegis heavy cruiser, unleashed its batteries on the main Star Adder settlements below, devastating the populations which had resisted with such tenacity. Their spiteful bite back against the garrison and the civilians on world showed how far the clans had fallen and made them no different than the Adders who had destroyed York. No Warhammer 2C or any second line mech will survive orbital bombardment, no matter how stubborn the pilot of the mech may seem. Things were not going to be easy for Khan Nabuta either, because while this was happening, he was exercising the last of his strength to crush the traitor Burox too. There would be misdirection and brutal attacks on both sides, but inevitably, the Burox and their society allies would be cornered and annihilated for their transgressions, with the last of the Burox who'd surrendered being walked out and liquidated, including their civilians. With all of this blood spilled and so much destroyed, things began to quiet, seemingly. Clan Steel Viper had brought Clan Coyote to heal. The Clan Council, despite protests from the beaten Coyotes, would order the annihilation of their science cast, as most of the society, from what they could tell, had originated from there. The Coyote Warriors themselves were forced to carry out this task, while being supervised, of course. What remained of this once proud clan were then subjected to trials, intent on weeding out who was loyal and deserving, and who was not. What came out on the other side of this was a maimed and forever altered Clan Coyote, and one that would never stray far from the path of the clans ever again. While Annihilation may have been a more just alternative for the whole of the clan for their treachery, Brent Andrews knew he needed more warm bodies for his eventual conquest of the Inner Sphere, so a breaking and reshaping of his enemies was needed, rather than a liquidation. Clan Hell's Horse's remnants in the clan homeworlds would be faced with scrutiny, as they had become an Inner Sphere clan as well. Accusations of corruption were hurled at them, despite the contingent in the homeworlds having no contact with their wayward brethren. The two were divided from one another, and would stand divided. A trial was fought, and Star Adder achieved victory, and the defenders had offered all that remained of the Hell's Horses as Isorla. Having found respect for these new peers, and seeing use in having another ally on the council, and a useful new friend, or puppet, Kanabuta made a calculated decision. With all of the horses in the homeworld now property of Clan Star Adder, Stanislav declared the creation of Clan Stone Lion, and placed all of the assets of the Hell's Horses they'd acquired, including its civilians and warriors, within this new clan. The Stone Lions would be granted all of the legacies and rights of the Hell's Horses as well. To prevent their new ally, but truly vassal, from being tampered with by their other predatory friends, Star Adder gave a quick and clear warning. And any clan finds the need to absorb this new member of our kin, 
or find the Star Adders standing to refute their right to do so. Khan Stanislav and Buta, February 3075. The tragedies of the last years were not over yet, even with this seeming final resolution. The guns would only be quiet for a few months and a little more. This was the last gentle lull before the final tragedies of this despicable era began to play out. Clan Steel Viper had been the face of much of what had happened, with Ilkhan Brett Andrews leading a crusade for purity through violence. But they were honestly where they were because it was convenient for the true power behind the throne. Failures of this era and bloodletting could now easily be placed as a crown upon this false king's head as the true sovereign took the reins of power and cast down their failed puppet. On July 29th, 3075, in another Grand Council meeting, after having dealt with the impacts of the society, Khan Stanislav Nabuta, the most powerful man in the Kerensky Cluster, having already secured the necessary support from his fellows, would confront the mad Ilkhan Andrews. Stanislav accused Clan Steel Viper of being just as tainted as the rest of the Inner Sphere clans, having been immersed in it themselves by partaking in the invasion. He called for an immediate vote, aimed at reaving this clan, the last one tainted by the Inner Sphere which Brett Andrews despised so much, his very own. The Ilgon immediately declared a trial of refusal, which Nabuta accepted for unaugmented combat. Before the two could be matched for this potential battle without weapons, Andrews drew a prohibited laser pistol and shot Nabuta between the eyes, ending the Star Adder Khan's life immediately. But the death of one man, no matter how important, is not the death of a king, because Khan Nabuta may have intended to wear that crown, but in truth, it was the clan, Star Adder, that was the king, not one man. The chamber was aghast at the violation of honor and of the rules and traditions which governed it. It is clear before us now that Clan Steel Viper and its leaders are more than just tainted. They are corrupt to the core. A simple reaving will not do. The Cloud Cobras call for the annihilation of Clan Steel Viper. Khan of the Clan Cloud Cobra, Halian Cardin. 3075, The Council Chambers. Brent Andrews was stripped on the spot of his position, though demanded a trial of refusal for that too, directing it towards the only remaining leader of Clan Star Adder, Sakhan Bonasek. Now the only Khan of his clan did not respond with words, and tackled Andrews to the ground without formally recognizing the challenge, before beating the vile former Ilkhan to death with the ceremonial mask of Clan Star Adder. The act of violence was so severe that he punched fragments of bone into the Steel Viper's brain after repeated savage blows to the hated abomination's face. Sakhan Banasek became Khan, and then Ilkhan only two months later, and led a trial of annihilation against the Steel Vipers. With the support of all the remaining clans, even Blood Spirit, it was certain that the Vipers would die by their hands, though it was not clear how many would have to die to see it done. Circe and New Kent were where most of the Vipers resided, and where their Tumen now mustered. Circe fell first, before New Kent was on the agenda. The fighting in the space above the world was harsh as even McKenna's pride was put into service to inform the Adders of their impending doom and their full denouncement and repudiation by the Council. The massed multi-clan assault made landfall shortly after the destruction of the Vipers in space, led by the Star Adder Tumen. The fighting was harsh, and it was without honor, 
The Vipers fought with bitterness, and much like the clans during the Reavings, armed their citizenry and used ambushes and traps to achieve battlefield successes, likely having been learned unironically from their experiences in the Federated Commonwealth and Tukiid. Omnimex or Second Line Mechs didn't matter in such battles. Annihilation was in order. The McKenna's pride would clear these Desgra forces by bombarding them from orbit, annihilating New Kent City in only a few minutes. None fled. They simply accepted their fate. This was the last stronghold of the once mighty clan at the center of the Wars of Reaving. Their fleet broken in space, and their capital in ruin, their tomb and dead. By February 10th, 3075, they were declared annihilated. A handful of years later, Clan Goliath Scorpion would be driven out, becoming a periphery power in the years that followed. Clan Bloodspirit's final enclaves were discovered by their compatriots only a few years later after Steel Viper's destruction, and without mercy or second thought, the Star Adders came for them, destroying their world's honor and haven by warship after stripping their planets of anything of value and butchering their weakened Tumen, and executing their on-ground actions with mechs like the Warhammer 2C. The Blood Spirit's last fortress, where they kept their genetic repositories, were destroyed from orbit. This is where the Star Adder's story ends. At the head of the pack, in the distant stars so far from Terra, the creators of many brilliant machines, and perhaps the most brilliant 2C battle mech in the history of the clans, lays upon these stars, watching and waiting for its opportunity. Clan Star Adder truly is the Serpent King of this now devastated region of space. Hail to the King. A product of the Blakestera and another Diamond Shark configuration of this legendary machine, the Warhammer 2C5 is a radical departure from any model that came out before it, and would be made broadly available to not only clan buyers, but Inner Sphere ones as well. Seemingly mostly produced on Twycross and Paxson before the destruction or capture of both of these facilities, before being moved to the Seafox Arc ships like Auxiliary Production Site 4, the mech would first begin walking off production lines and into battle in 3070. There are big changes made to the mech for it to accommodate its new weapons package. First, it drops its heatsink total to 14, reducing its heat by 28 per turn instead of 40. Next, it drops its armor by a half ton, causing a decline in its overall armor points down to 220. How is this a radical departure from the original, you may ask? Well, the answers come in the form of its magnetic weaponry. The Warhammer 2C5 pivots heavily away from energy offense, and embraces the Hyper Assault Goss Weaponry Revolution. Removing its traditional PPCs or even heavy large lasers in each arm, the 5 then equips a pair of powerful HAG-20 cannons in their place. Each cannon is given 12 rounds of ammunition, which isn't a huge total, but it's enough for most engagements. To back these up, it has a head-mounted SRM-4 streak, and 4 torso-mounted heavy-medium lasers for if fighting comes too close and threatens the mech. The heavy medium lasers do hit hard, but they are unfortunately not particularly accurate, as you all know. It does run cool enough under most conditions, though if fighting gets too close and desperate, the mech may run hot while trying to spray down its opposition. Overall, the 5 is a fascinating design and delivers deadly salvos. The first recorded Snow Raven built variant of the Warhammer 2C, the 2C6 first appeared in 3071, one year after the 2C5. Only seen in use by Clan Snow Raven in their new home in the Outworlds Alliance, later to be known as the Raven Alliance, as well as being deployed and operated by Clan Ghost Bear, this mighty 80 ton machine is another wild departure from convention. Once more, it leans into HAG weapons technologies. 
The only difference in this model from the original's core system features is that it has a reduced heatsink total down to 15, only allowing it to cool 30 every turn. Beyond this, it retains its 20 RPPCs in the arms, which will cause the mech to run hot if it moves and fires these main cannons, or if it fires them in combination with its heaviest weapon system, because backing these up in the right torso, it has a HAG-30 with 16 rounds of ammunition. If it doesn't move and fires all three weapons together, which is really ideally what you'd have it do, the mech overheats by six every round of fire. Also to note, it does have an ER small laser mounted in the head. While by no means is this a bad configuration, the six unfortunately really does push the boundaries of how useful it can be, when its primary bracketed weapons fire will struggle to keep cool under most conditions. If all three weapon systems hit though, they will provide devastating results. Still, one can't help but feel that this particular iteration of the Warhammer 2C is a bit out of place, despite its potential lethality. One of the greatest departures from the Star Adder inception of the mech, as if following in line with the previous two models, and another clan Snow Raven machine, this one built in 3079, the Warhammer 2C7 is based not on the original 2C mech, but on the Warhammer 6R, and in multiple ways. It also pushed the technological edge at the time of its construction, and is wildly more expensive, and is harder to maintain as a machine compared to any other model that I've listed so far. Funnily enough, the mech is also expected to operate in sustained space operations too, though it can be used in normal environments as needed. It starts by installing a Clantec 320XL engine, making the mech more fragile but saving it a significant amount of tonnage. Due to space constraints on board because of this, however, the 7 is forced to dump its ferrofibrous plating and switch it out for standard armor. It then doesn't increase the tonnage for this kind of protection either, meaning its armor points are dropped to 192, which is not impressive for an 80-ton battleline assault mech from this time period. But this once more mirrors the original mech in this respect as well, as the Warhammer 6R2 was a bit light on defense, if only just. Two tons are dedicated towards cargo space in its center torso as well, in case it's deployed in space operations and needs fuel. Once again, its heatsink total is reduced to 15, letting the mech manage its thermals by 30 every turn. And just like other models that do this, it skirts the edges of being overburdened by its firepower output as a result. Six improved jump jets are installed into the mech, letting it leap up to 180 meters in a single turn, or six movement points in the tabletop game, which is exceptional as it can clear large terrain features and generate significant defensive movement bonuses through jumping. Before delving into its weaponry, the last thing it has to try to offset some of its lost armor and make the mech more survivable in other ways, it has an ECM suite. When it comes to weaponry, it has a lot, just like its inspiration. Unsurprisingly, things start with twin arm-mounted clan ER PPCs. Each arm then boasts a single backup ER medium laser as well. It has dual micropulse lasers, with one in each side torso, and it can use these to devastating effect. A duo of medium pulse lasers can be found in the same locations too, giving it a hard punch in close when combined with its other medium lasers, should it need to cool down its PPCs or not overheat when in combat. Finally, for scatter damage, it has an ATM-6 on the right torso with 3 tons of ammunition, letting it have 10 rounds of each tactical missile type as needed. The Warhammer 2C7 is an excellent machine, if used wisely. It is overgunned in many conditions, so weapons fire must be bracketed and firing priorities must be taken very seriously when piloting it. Its limited armor plating and XL engine are major causes for concern if the mech gets caught in the open, but its very adaptable and useful six improved jump jets can help it avoid these kinds of circumstances, or mitigate them. Still, for all of its flexibility, it comes at a steep cost both in production and battle value, and in trade-offs. A fascinating mech, and a very different one from its peers.
Another one of these series built by Clan Diamond Shark, this time entirely from its inner sphere holdings in 3079. The Warhammer 2C8 is another major departure from its original template, more so than the 2C7, and is an expensive battle mech, even more so than the Raven's Machine. To get things started right off the bat, the 2C8 installs a massive 26.5 ton Clantech 400XL engine, letting this monster run at 86 kilometers per hour. After this, it has 19 double heat sinks, letting it reduce its heat by a respectable 38 every turn. Its armor is dropped to 11.5 tons, but it retains its ferro fibrous quality, yielding at 220 points of advanced steel plating. So, what is this fast paced machine armed with? It goes back to the 2C3's idea of installing heavy large lasers instead of PPCs. And in this instance, it's mostly to save on weight, I suspect. A Streak SRM-6 is then fitted into the right torso, letting it deliver devastating close-range missile bombardments. In the side torsos, it maintains a pair of ER medium lasers as backup weapons too, which hit hard and offer a great return on tonnage. After this, to disable enemy mechs and annihilate enemy infantry and vehicle formations, it has a pair of plasma cannons, with one in each arm and with 10 shots each. These weapons do no damage to enemy mechs directly, but can spike their heat badly, or even causing them to go through catastrophic conditions, like ammunition explosions or shutdowns. So is the 2C8 a solid machine? Certainly it has its advantages. It hits hard and runs fast. It can run and fire its two heavy large lasers and not overheat as well. Again, like many other adaptations of the Warhammer 2C, it can't alpha strike and certainly can't do so safely. While its engine gives it more mobility, which means more options, and even more potential defensive bonuses, it also reduces its survivability, as the mech will be crippled on an ammunition explosion or the loss of a side torso. Overall, the 2C8, like many of its peers, if managed well, can be quite the performer. This one, however, does have quite the price tag associated with it, both in-universe and in-game. Though I am sure this is something Clan Seafox is more than fine with. Of course, I wish I could say that this was the most expensive Warhammer 2C, but we still have the Dark Age to investigate too. The Snow Raven wastes nothing, a scavenger par excellence. It makes use of materials abandoned by others. It works in harmony with the other beasts, and is the perfect companion. Ilkhan Nicholas Kerensky, the great father of the clans, 2810. Dominance. That was the reality of the day during the latter portion of the 31st century, and into the Dark Age, for Clan Diamond Shark on its distribution of clan technologies across the Inner Sphere. Controlling this market made the clan enormously wealthy, but where there is money to be made, others will inevitably get involved. Simply put, there is a craving by others to compete for something so precious. While the journey of Clan Starrider with the Warhammer 2C really begins at the start, and Clan Diamond Shark's road to the mech is very much tied to the decisions made along the path to Tukiid, it is not so with the new, premier distributor of the battle mech in the Dark Age and Ill Clan era. The Diamond Sharks, now once more naming themselves Clan Seafox, who are also now, I should add, configured into regional conates, would find that their monopoly of the distribution of clan mechs in the Inner Sphere, and their lock on the distribution of Clan Star Adder's beast, the Warhammer 2C, was being challenged. Due to the return to form of their old, hated rival, Clan Snow Raven. 
forever blessed with the genetics and descendants of House McKenna, the founder of the Terran hegemony. The Snow Raven's expulsion from the homeworlds at the hands of the Snake Alliance had been savage. An enormous amount had been lost at the hands of its former friends and allies. Huge portions of their rightly feared fleet had been lost forever, and the Ravens were left with no worlds to call their own. All of this said nothing of the loss of millions of their civilians, who were trapped and taken as Isola or eradicated in the Kerensky Cluster. Only through taking refuge with their newly acquired friends in the Inner Sphere, the Outworlds Alliance, did the Ravens themselves survive this violent and traumatic exile to the Inner Sphere. Regardless of these difficulties, however, the Ravens did indeed survive. And through their cunning and nature, they would thrive in this new region of opportunity. Where most viewed the Outworlds Alliance as a chronically poor, backward state with little to offer anyone, beyond being a victim of the Draconis Combine, and sometimes a victim of the Federated Sons, upon their arrival, the Snow Ravens saw potential. The Alliance had several key pieces of important facilities left over from the Star League, which while in disrepair, were most certainly salvageable. Due to several incidents upon their arrival, the Ravens found themselves not only desperate, but in a poor negotiating position with their new friends and allies, and would further discover as a result that they would be required to completely refurbish a set of Star League orbital facilities around Quarter Bell, not necessarily for their own use, but for the Outworld's Alliance use. This would eventually work out in their favor regardless, as eventually the Ravens integrated further with the Outworld's Alliance to form the Raven Alliance. A hybrid state the Ravens hoped to model off of the Rosselhaig Dominion. Economic activity, with new clan tech level facilities in this agrarian and backwards region of space, culminated in the Outworld's portion of the Alliance's economy beginning to boom. Counter to traditional clan thinking, their streamlining of industries and the construction of new ones across the now Raven Alliance was done in ways to not just make the economy boom, but to increase the living standards of the people within the Alliance. New technologies that helped with basic living, construction, and mining brought growth and prosperity that saw their regular citizenry benefit. The new civilian industries beginning to emerge, which now dealt in high-quality goods, caused a large increase in cross-border trade with the Federated Sons, improving relations between the Alliance and House Davian as well. The Snow Raven's jump ship fleet, which could now be serviced from Quarter Bell, also pushed this economic development, allowing for a greater flow of goods too, and with better controls on cost for their transport. All of this in turn incentivized the Outworld's Alliance political establishment to continue to support the new Raven Alliance, rather than cause a breakdown in relations. Most of these technologies and industries were benign, in fact, and not built around military hardware. Military hardware, however, would be something that followed, as Clan Snow Raven saw opportunity to expand their influence and to grow their wealth by cutting into Clan Seafox's operations. Dante, the new capital for the Snow Ravens within the Raven Alliance, and the home to their genetic repository, became the site for Industrial Complex Alpha. This was to be the premier military production facility in the Alliance. It became fully operational as of 3079, but its production would only expand as time went on, becoming a burgeoning industrial colossus. Resources were harvested from across the Alliance, now helping the economy boom even more so than just the benign, simple output their technology and presence had brought. And these new resources flowed towards this new center of manufacturing and military output. From here, a multitude of powerful battle mechs were assembled under the Raven's banner. From Omnimex to standard issue machines, it didn't matter. This production was used to outfit the Snow Raven Tumen once more as it recovered from the harrowing of the Wars of Reaving in the Blakest Era, but it was also used to arm and equip the relatively small armies of the Outworld's Alliance. 
as if mirroring the journey of the Star Adders in their own way. This beating mechanical heart in the center of a territory with vast resources became the cauldron that would forge the Warhammer 2C once again. As the decades rolled forwards as well, many of these battle mechs took on new forms, with new loadouts, shifting the chassis in major ways, and fundamentally altering the mech's properties. And to compete with the other Warhammer 2Cs, perhaps built by their friends, and the now former clan Diamond Shark, and their Conates, who undoubtedly were doing the same thing. Not only did these relentless machines find their way into the hands of the Tumen and the army military core of the Outworld's Alliance, but it would begin a journey to be spread far and wide, past the borders of the Alliance, and into the waiting hands of their allies and clients. Clan Ghostbear of the Rosselhaig Dominion became a major partner of the Ravens in this new world of the Inner Sphere, and they would have a significant exchange of goods and weaponry between the two states over the decades, where the Warhammer 2C found usage in the two armies of its allies, the Kung's Army and the Ghostbear Tumen. The Federated Sons, their new trading partner during the beginnings of the Dark Age, took the opportunity to acquire this mech from the Snow Ravens too. This is where things became more interesting. Because of their major merchant fleet, and because of their new, powerful industrial base, though not as mighty or as plentiful as their Sea Fox rivals, this would begin to intrude on the de facto monopoly the Sea Foxes had enjoyed. In fact, Complex Alpha on Dante, by the beginning of the Ill Clan era, was producing as many Warhammer 2Cs for distribution, or more, than the entirety of the Sea Fox Conates. A critical point of this as well is during the Dark Age, before the Snow Ravens began to truly muscle their way into this very lucrative market. One of the most popular mechs clan Sea Fox individually distributed to its clients was the Warhammer 2C, making this move into the market something that the Foxes definitely noticed, and it wasn't the only one. When combined with other machines like the recently unveiled Blood Asp, another design the Raven stole from the Star Adders who had ruthlessly tried to stamp them out, a real challenge began to take shape towards the Sea Foxes in their own traditional realm of market dominance. From the Draconis Combine through to the Federated Sons, Rosselhaig Dominion, Capellan Confederation, Magistry of Canopus, and even the Duchy of Endurian, arms flowed freely from the merchant fleets of the Snow Ravens, undercutting or cutting into their Sea Fox counterparts, making them the premier supplier of many machines in the Inner Sphere now, but also making them confirmed as being a mainstay seller of this glorious war machine. And the Warhammer 2C is a war machine, because despite having avoided most major conflicts so far, the Raven Alliance has picked at the edges of their neighbors. Battles with the Draconis Combine demonstrated the Warhammer 2C's power and prestige, as well as taking the planet of Pajarto from the Federated Suns amidst an internal dispute and the Ravens felt they could expand their holdings, if only slightly. The Ravens themselves even played a dangerous game with the Davians, manipulating the reviled and unstable First Prince Caleb Davian into his demise with a promise of military aid, only to leave him to die, rightly, on Palmyra. Allegedly, they even sold out his position to the Draconis Combine in favor of new worlds. The chaos within their dangerous neighbors too, only further served their purpose and agenda, as they prepared their own plots and schemes. But this would not be the end of the violent streak of the Snow Ravens. No, for at the heart of the Inner Sphere, Clan Wolf, led by Alaric Ward, had seized Terra, becoming the Ill Clan. All of the Inner Sphere clans, save one, submitted to the authority of this new commanding presence in the Inner Sphere. A third Star League has been declared even, by the Ilkhan of this new Ill Clan. Snow Raven vessels now pass through the Federated Suns, on a destination not yet divulged to the public. 
but quite clearly their approach is towards the home of humanity. Even the unfortunately dim-witted Rosselhaig Dominion understands what has appeared. The powers that will keep this new Star League alive are not the battered and bruised warriors who vanquished the now desolated and defeated Republic of the Sphere. Clans, Snow Raven, and Sea Fox, in spite of their long, bitter histories with one another, appear to be the key allies supporting this new enterprise. There may be the malformed corpses of Jade Falcon and Smoke Jaguar there as well, but these entities are propped up by the weakened wolf, and exist only at its leisure. They are little more than their creatures now. If all is as it appears to be, the Warhammer 2C, the one originally built by Clan Star Adder, will have new fields to fight in. These machines are already in the inventories of the besieged Wolf League, but will clearly be supported by both their Fox and Raven allies both with replacement machines and likely with their own forces. There is an irony, however, in that those who would see the League die to fulfill their own ambitions, in the shapes of the Free Worlds League and Capellan Confederation, have long since bought and deployed these mighty titans for themselves. In fact, Thaddeus Merrick, the now deceased Warden General of the Free Worlds League, piloted a Warhammer 2C, just as an example. The Warhammer 2C will not only be fighting on the side of its originators and their allies, it will be fighting on the side of their enemies, bringing all of that aforementioned strength and power that the Star Adders infused it with to their doorsteps as well. Regardless, despite the inconvenience of facing their own weaponry, I don't think this is a particularly big problem, even for the Ravens or Sea Fox's points of view. Because sometimes there is more to be gained in controlling the flow of goods than in helping your friends. Because hey, it's just business. A product of the early Republic era, more specifically of 3086, also known as the first half of the Dark Age era, the Warhammer 2C9 is one of the most expensive battle mechs of any era due to its cutting edge engine, which may not pay off in quite the way the Sea Foxes, its creators, believed. Exclusively built by and for its clan of origin, the Warhammer 2C9 is in many senses a strange battle mech. To start with, the 2C9 installs a 17.5 ton 400XXL engine, which yes, allows it to run up to 86 kilometers per hour. Now there is a downside to this, you might imagine. First, the power plant itself is painfully expensive to produce, and second, it is far more vulnerable than a traditional clan tech engine. The loss of the side torso is the immediate destruction of any mech with a double XL engine, just like a lower quality Star League or Inner Sphere XL engine. As if this weren't bad enough, the XXL engine generates passive heat at all times, in some form, for the mech to be burdened with as well. And this must be taken into consideration when building this machine too. Still, it does save more weight than a traditional XL engine, and that does give the mech more options to work with for the machine's other features. The 9 changes its cooling system once more, though not in response to its XXL engine, leaving the mech with 16 double heat sinks, letting it reduce its thermals by 32 every turn. Beyond this, it maintains the same structure and ferro fibrous plating as the original stock model. This leads us to its other equipment. To start with, to add to its defense, it has an ECM suite, adding an invisible layer of electronic protection to the machine. As far as weaponry goes, it changes out its traditional, more common energy weapons in its arms in favor of twin Clantech rotary AC5 autocannons. Racks fire in multiple bursts, and while the Clantech ones don't weigh less than their inner sphere counterparts, they do shoot further, much further. With the same effective range as an LRM launcher, 
These twin cannons can lay down waves of withering fire on anyone foolish enough to cross this mech's path. The ammunition on board is respectable for these pair of death-dealing cannons too, as it has a combined total of 120 rounds of ammunition. Backing these up, it has a Clantech LRM-10 launcher, as throwing out damage sets of 5 across 21 hexes wasn't enough just with the two cannons apparently. Because of the uncertainty behind scatter weaponry, it's not likely to deliver a horrifying 70 damage turn on turn, but the potential is there. And that is exceptional. Finally, it has a pair of ER medium lasers and ER small lasers, split between the side torsos. These are here for the mech to defend itself in close, should it be unable to stave off enemy forces from getting to that range with it. This is a quick moving, hard hitting assault mech. No one can dispute that. But is it worth almost nine times as much as the original Warhammer 2C in production cost? Does it provide that much value to Clan Seafox? With their almost unlimited resources, it probably does. But I would argue it's a very niche buy. And one that is more than a little fragile. If it gets caught out in the open. Due to its XXL engine. On the tabletop, it is a useful machine. If you're willing to pay the BV for it. Another Seafox model for broad distribution, the Warhammer 2C-10 is a sniping machine that almost manages to stay heat neutral, and one that has a highly explosive close range set of backup weapons. First introduced in 3120, while the HPG grid was still active I should be clear, the 10 is much more reflective of the original ideas behind the Warhammer 2C. Returning to a standard engine and retaining its 12 tons of ferrofibrous armor, it does upgrade its cooling to an immense 23 double heat sinks, bringing its thermal reduction to 46 every turn. By the way, it's still overheating, if only just, when firing its impressive payload of lasers on board. But let's go over those now. Because its main focus in the category of offense is four Clantec ER large lasers. These reach out to almost insane ranges, and scorch enemies with the force of an inner sphere PPC. They are arranged with two in each arm, and they are the main arm-based weaponry of the mech. They collectively do 40 points of damage and generate 48 points of heat. If a pilot knows what they are doing, and cycles their weapons appropriately, it will be an excellent long-range sniper. For up-close defense, it has a head-mounted ER small laser and a pair of torso-mounted standard SRM-6 launchers. The launchers are superb for blasting down enemies which have already been torn open by its large lasers, or for dealing with disrupting flankers, like enemy light mechs. Overall, it's a solid buy for most operators, and an excellent machine overall. Just listen to me very carefully and you'll be fine. You don't need to Alpha Strike every turn. I know it's tempting, but you really don't have to. Save your battle mech for another battle. Don't watch it melt into the surface of the planet you're on. Yet another model for export and internal consumption by Clan Seafox, the Warhammer 2C11 was first built in 3124, only four years after the 10, and once more is a denizen of the Dark Age of Battletech. Armed for close encounters, as well as potentially thriving in dense terrain despite its lack of jump jets, this monstrosity does what it can to deliver hellish alpha strikes. As unlike many other Warhammer 2Cs, it can deliver these with a degree of safety. To make this possible, the Eleven leans into focusing on weaponry that work hand in hand with one another, and provide a solid return on tonnage investment. But before we get into that, let's start with how it has 24 double heat sinks on board which disperse a shocking 48 points of heat per turn, as this is how it will deliver its brutal alpha strikes. Next, it has 14.5 tons of standard plating, providing it with 232 points of armor, the same as if it had 12 tons of Clan Ferrovirus plating. Once more relying on heavy laser technology, the Eleven installs twin heavy large lasers in place of its traditional PPC loadouts. These are less accurate, but as we've discussed prior, hit very hard. They generate 36 points of heat in total as well, which is easily cast off by its impressive cooling system. To back these up, it has a head-mounted ER medium laser, 
and critically, two Streak SRM6 launchers. The streaks on this are an incredible pairing with its heavy large lasers, as if all weapons hit, it will deliver a hellish 55 points of damage, and can do this almost every turn, outside of having to cycle its ER medium laser to prevent it from overheating too badly. Oh, and it has two anti-personnel pods on board, just in case platoons of infantry get the wrong idea. It is a very powerful and robust battle mech to be sure, and I am positive that Clan Seafox has had little trouble marketing and selling them. Manufactured in 3130 for exclusive use by Clan Seafox internally, the Warhammer 2C12 is the latest generation variant of this devastating, storied chassis to appear in the Battletech timeline by the Seafoxes themselves as of the making of this piece. A clear follow-up to the Warhammer 2C9, this machine barely has any room for weaponry on board, and feels like a boondoggle. Mirroring the 9 in many ways, including its hyper-expensive 400XXL engine and ECM suite, its primary difference lays in its extremely tonnage-hungry armor and heatsinks. First, the mech has 20 double heatsinks on board, mirroring the original 2C by Clan Star Adder and letting it manage up to 40 heat every turn. It then goes on to have 23 tons of heat dissipating armor, giving it 230 points of protection. This is an expensive new armor type that prevents it from being impacted by infernal weaponry or plasma weaponry or anything of the sort that would artificially increase its heat. It's a full 10 tons more than the original 2C's plating to get the same armor. But don't worry, other mechs can't warm it up. Why didn't they just install five more heat sinks? Apologies, but this mech is immensely expensive, and this technology appears to be the height of waste to have built the mech around, because it suffers when it comes to offense. The 12 simply has two ER PPCs, two ER medium lasers, two ER small lasers, and an SRM6. While this is close in theory to the original, it's nowhere near as accurate, and it is dramatically less survivable due to its XXL engine. It runs much hotter too, due to a combination of this engine and retaining its ER PPCs. There are no bad Warhammer 2Cs per se, but this machine is underwhelming on a tactical level, and on a strategic level, offers so little for the immense cost of its XXL engine that it is hard to imagine that these would be a desirable mech to deploy. But it is a Sea Fox exclusive. The Foxes are better merchants than warriors or engineers, if this mech is anything to go by, obviously. While this may be their latest model, it might be their greatest shame. The absolute latest generation model of the Warhammer 2C, and the one which rebalances its internal attributes in a big way, is the Warhammer 2C-13. This iteration of the Warhammer is the latest model to walk off the production facilities on Dante, in the final days of the Dark Age, and now into the Ill Clan era. It is also exclusively deployed by the Ravens for their own domestic consumption. And it is not hard to see why. Heavily influenced by the Ancestral model, as well as the Warhammer 2C2, this Raven machine looks to perfect its heavy fire support role, all while giving the mech a vicious bite at close range. It is as though someone took the virtues of the 1 and the 2 and simply combined them. To make this work, several sacrifices have to be made. First, it uses a 320XL power plant rather than a standard, lowering its durability. Next, it has to remove its feral fibers in exchange for standard, dropping its protection to a mere 192 points, which is limited for the tonnage bracket it's in, but it is still workable for its intended role. The 13 also has 21 heat sinks, meaning it can dump a thermal buildup of 42 every turn, which is great for its bracketed weapons fire. So what does the 13 offer? Death. Death is what it offers. It retains the original ER PPCs on board, keeping them in the arms. After this, it installs five Clantech medium pulse lasers, just like the original and in the same locations. It also complements these once more with this standard SRM-6 with one ton of ammunition, 
meaning it can go into battle with either standard or inferno rounds, but it has to be selected beforehand. But oh wait, the payload doesn't stop there, because then it installs twin LRM-15s from the Warhammer 2 C2, bringing its firepower to an insane level, while retaining 12 rounds of fire per launcher. At long range, it can unleash twin ERPPCs and twin LRM-15s. As opponents get closer, they will be strafed with medium pulse lasers, SRMs, and potentially a combination of selected ERPPC or LRM fire. This mech has layers of defense, not through its armor plating, but through the layers of potential withering fire it will force its opponents to go through to get to it. Despite the 2C6 attempting to be a remake of the original 6R, the truth is, the 13 is what that mech was in spirit. It is an assembly of more and more dangerous offensive tools that bring the enemy further into its fire until there is nothing left but scrap in misfortune. The Warhammer 2C13, regardless of the trade-offs it has to make, offers so much value and firepower, even if it has to be bracketed, and it has so many tools and so much battlefield viability that it is impossible to do anything but acknowledge it for what it is. The Ultimate Warhammer There will be a time when our descendants return to reclaim what is our right. With honor swelling their hearts, they will crusade against the dark emotions that have dimmed the inner sphere for so long. But with the glory comes responsibility. Without a pure soul, we cannot give sight to their blind lives, but will only blind ourselves. The Remembrance, Passage 3, Verse 41, Lines 1 through 8. There are few battle mechs in the history of Battletech that can command the attention the Warhammer 2C deserves on its journey through the eras of the setting. There are fewer machines still that have risen, fallen, and risen again that tell a story of so many factions being married to their successes and failures as this legacy-driven titan. When Clan Star Adder looked into the past and looked into their own doctrines, ones which much more closely align with the virtues and values of real conflict, rather than the dualist culture which had developed across clan space. They found something that would be ideal for their Tumen. It was in its own way an unspoken defiance to the ways of the clan's martial tradition by its very construction, and a true repudiation of the almost childish and unreasonable ways of the sociopathic utopian-inspired madman who was the father of the clans. Instead of extravagance, and being built to be tailored to the narcissistic tendencies inspired in clan warriors, it was constructed to be pragmatic, practical, and powerful, hundreds of years before the clan invasion, when it was first given form in 2829, while Nicholas Kerensky himself still drew breath. Clan Star Adder had begun the process of fabricating something that would stand the test of time and would be the kind of war machine needed to conquer the far-flung stars that surrounded the birthplace of mankind in the Inner Sphere. The clans see themselves as the descendants of the SLDF, but their attitudes and beliefs are alien to the army that they descended from, as at one time they were spheroids themselves. They became more Nicholas Kerensky's creatures than the noble warriors who attempted to defend House Cameron, but in its own small way. The Warhammer 2C is a glimmer of the light that was lost when the Pentagon worlds descended into madness. The light almost went out when Clan Mongoose overwhelmed these machines built of noble purpose and form, and only a few decades after the death of the Great Father of the Clans. A weapon in purest form, it would be relegated to the inexperienced and the unwanted within the clans for two centuries, along with many other second-line machines denied the respect it deserved, and denied the glory it was due. It simply sank beneath the attention or notice of those who would one day launch their invasion into the Inner Sphere. 
and it was here that the clans would fail in their attempt to restore their corrupted vision of the Star League. All of their years of bad ideas, or distrust and disunity, would come to the foreground for all to see. But in the wake of their failure on Tukiad and Operation Revival as a whole, the Warhammer 2C finally would be put on display for the warrior that it truly was, starting with it salvaging what was left of Clan Diamond Shark. The snake-crafted battle mech emerged as the champion it always was, relatively easy to maintain, durable and hard to remove from any battlefield. It held firm against the raids and advances of the barbarians of the Inner Sphere, earning the mech the beginning of a new level of respect. That recognition and honor would be cemented with its smashing of Clan Bloodspirit at the hands of Clan Star Adder in the Wars of Reaving. It was put on display for all the clans to see the error of their ways. The reversal of fortunes could not be any more real. The dueling Omnimex, the ones so prized by so many, were left beaten and broken on the battlefields of York, and it would be the Warhammer 2C standing tall over them, not just claiming victory over the vanquished, but claiming victory over the centuries of humiliation and misguided beliefs the clans themselves had desperately grasped onto, in the name of their own vanity and arrogance. In the Inner Sphere, the results would be spectacular. Frontline clan warriors willingly sought out these juggernauts, causing an inflation in the wealth and influence of the re-emerging Clan Diamond Shark, turning it into a massive windfall for the merchant-driven clan. In the years and decades that followed, these bipedal combat vehicles only further would increase the wealth of the Fox, as it distributed them across the Inner Sphere, even into the hands of the barbarians they'd tried to conquer. It would be the other exiles of the clan homeworlds, however, that usurped the Fox and the mastery of this machine and now begin to upset the balance of power within the markets of war across almost two-thirds of the Inner Sphere. Other projects have also been at the tips of their beaks as they've picked at the Sea Fox's meal, becoming increasingly wealthy themselves off of this supreme fighting machine, one which is lusted after by clan warriors as well as Inner Sphere soldiers and nobles alike. What was once the hidden prize of Clan Star Adder is now the icon of what it was meant to be, and it increasingly is uplifted by the wings of a powerful raven. The Warhammer 2C also has one more story to tell, because it is a tale of it being undervalued. It is a tale of it being left behind because of the whims of the day, and because sometimes things just fall out of trends. But it never lost its value. It is the story of the clans and their arrogance, as well as their unwillingness to accept the world for what it is. When they finally came down from their high perch to stand amongst the realities of war, they discovered what they had rejected for so long was a component of their salvation. They discovered what the engineers, warriors, and scientists of Clan Star Adder did when they opted to bring the original Warhammer into the future. They found a machine that would carry them through the uncertainties of the path not yet charted, and it would bring them glory and Terra. They found the Lord of War. Clan Star Adder. The mere mention of our name evokes differing emotions in different individuals across the Kerensky Cluster. Some hear it as an epithet, a stain on Nicholas Kerensky's dreams. Others see us as wayward children who must be shown the light. We know the truth. We see beyond the illusions of others. When Nicholas Kerensky founded the clans, he entrusted each of us with the future, including the reunification of the Inner Sphere under the banner of the Star League. Before that can happen, however, we of the clans must come together. The Star Adder, native to the world of Arcadia, is a pure predator. So are we 
unhindered by the external influences that have corrupted not only the inner sphere, but also our brother clans. Throughout the two and a half centuries of our existence, we have heard our fellow clans' taunts and accusations, and gone on in spite of them. We have outlived our mortal enemies and moved against those who threaten the fabric of our civilization. Above all, we have survived. That more than anything proves our worth. Loremaster Dagmar Lahiri of Clan Star Adder, 26th of July, 3059. Well, that was quite the experience now, wasn't it? First, I want to thank you all for joining me here today, after these four hours of fun. Remember, if you enjoyed this content, smashing the like button definitely helps. And if you want to follow my content, subscribing also assists with that too. However, I am about to get into a lot of the notes and credits for this Goliath-sized video. So bear with me, we're not over yet if you want to know the full rundown of how this video came together. So, let's get started, shall we? When I originally set out to make this video, I intended to model it on the Mad Dog video, which is what most of my long-form videos are in fact based on, from the Longbow through to the Timberwolf. They all kind of share its general form. But here's the part where I get to start thanking people. Because I'd reached out to Alex Knight, one of the fact checkers at Catalyst Game Labs. I had been looking through the master unit list for an indication as to who originally made the Warhammer 2C, which I thought was just going to be a ghost bear mech, who I've already covered before. I was kind of down over it, to be honest, not because it's bad, but because I've tread that path before, with the Executioner video more specifically. When he informed me that it wasn't derived from the bears, because its planet of origin was in fact Sheridan in 2829, that meant that it was, in actuality, a Star Adder mech. This opened up enormous opportunities for the video, and I decided to make something akin to the Stone Rhino and Executioner videos instead. I just didn't realize how far it would balloon given the scope of the coverage. I have cut about 45 minutes to an hour worth of content out of this video in terms of its script, just to give some perspective most of which was in the Wars of Reaving, just to make the video frankly presentable. And I do still think this video is too big, even though I'm very proud of it. It's just, I don't think there is anything more I can cut and still have the premise of the video work. This is the single biggest project I've ever done. This represents two and a half months worth of work. I think it conveys everything I wanted, and I hope this is something everyone enjoyed. Whether you only watched a few chapters or the entire video, whether it be the narrative content you enjoyed or the tactical and technical breakdown portions of it. But I will say at its core, this is a video about Star Adder, Sea Fox, Snow Raven, and how the clans treated second line units. It also follows all of this, of course, through the journey of one mech, from start to finish, from its heights to its lows, to a restoration, if not surpassing its original purpose and place. I really love how it came together and how the narrative weaved itself. When I built this script and it was spinning out of control, I started reaching out to Alan Blackwell, a CGL freelancer and someone who designed the channel's mascot, The Rock. Alan, with a really tight period of time, managed to get out all four of these pieces for the video. And I actually can't thank him enough. 
as I feel each one of these helps breathe life into the piece itself and helped inspire me in terms of my delivery of lines and in terms of my perception of the eras it covered. And that says nothing of the voice contributions to this video as well outside of my own. Before I get into the special thanks and credits in their entirety, instead of just saying to check out the top pin comment below for the resources I used, and I will still be providing the links there of course, this is a list of most of the direct resources I used to piece this monster of a video together. You will see them on screen now, but I'm also going to mention them. The CGL Battle for Tukiad book. Most importantly, Field Manual Crusader Clans. Field Manual Warden Clans. Field Manual Update. The Wars of Reaving. Operation Klondike. Dominions Divided. Technical Readout 3055, the original. Technical Readout Project Phoenix. Recognition Guide Volume 1 Classics. Technical Readout Clan Invasion, and Technical Readout 3085. I also used Technical Readout 3145 specifically for references regarding late generation models of the Warhammer 2C. The Master Unit List was of course also used. If you're wanting to get your hands on a Warhammer 2C in plastic, these are available in the Clan Heavy Star, and you can either get them at your local game store, or you can order them through CGL or your own preferred online retailers. However, I will provide a link to the product on the CGL store in the top pinned comment of the video too. To get onto the lists and lists of people to thank, first and foremost I want to thank Alex Knight for putting up with my questions when seeking clarity on certain things when he didn't really have to. And I want to also thank Alan Blackwell. This video would not have been possible in any capacity without the two of you. Or at least it wouldn't be recognizable. Next, I want to thank the incredible voice talents who agreed to lend their voices to this project. Tex from the Black Pants Legion does the voice of Absalom True Scott and did an incredible job doing it. He is a great content creator, a friend, and makes the best Battletech content on YouTube. Yes, I am aware that you all know who he is, but I don't care. Check out the Black Pants Legion's work. If you haven't, you are really missing out. Next on the list of contributors, of course, is another friend of the channel, Mechanical Frog, who did the entirety of the Remembrance quotes in the video. Frog makes spectacular content, getting a video out almost every four days on average, I'm pretty sure, and has a fantastic style of coverage. Once more, I would advise you to indulge yourselves in his content as well. I believe his Wolverine Battle Mech video came out recently, or is about to, in fact. Of course, doing the role of Aaron de Chevier, we have the incredible mech warrior content creator, The Beef. Beef is yet another one of my cohorts, my comrades if you will, and I strongly recommend seeking out his work. He recently started posting new content again, and has a fantastic video on the Centurion that just went live last week. And now we have Sven Vanderplank, who is an amazing Battletech content creator and did an incredible job doing the Star Adder voices within the video. He's recently started covering the Second Succession Wars in a series of videos, and in my view, this is must-see content. After this, we've got Paul, or 30th Century Fox. Paul's one of my frequent co-hosts and compatriots on Six Sides of Gaming's Friday Night Aces, and I appreciate him lending his voice to play the ever-infamous Ilkhan Brett Andrews. Come join us on Six Sides some Fridays. We'll have a lot of fun. The final voice on the video, lending her voice as several clan warriors, is Rem Alternus, CGL's community manager. I asked her if she'd like to provide the roles, as she does do voice work as well, and she was kind enough to supply them. A huge thank you to Rem for that. The gameplay footage in this video needed to be captured with the help of a multitude of people, many of whom just follow the channel while I livestream, or have joined the channel's Discord community. The gameplay footage used in the technical and battle portions of the video could not have been done without you guys. Thank you. The full list of everyone who participated is on screen now. Speaking of gameplay footage, this video's use of it was only made possible because of the hard work of the Yamal community, also known as the Yet Another Mech Lab mod, and its sub-mod, Yet Another Clan Mech mod. A huge shout out to Deathraiser, Malam Umbra, Scarface and Truig for their hard work. Thank you guys for making this possible. Finally, I want to recognize all of the channel's members. 
but I do have to give special recognition to all of the channel's Captain Generals who were at this tier during the video's creation. Without your support specifically, the artwork done for this video would have not been possible. Without all of the channel members, what I do here wouldn't be possible. Still, I offer a sincere and special thanks to Besker, Conductifier, Ryefields, Polaris198, Telos, Manicoa, Kaylee86, Iron Darkness Darkness, Adherent of Lady Columbia, Chad Layden, Trucking Joe, and Odin Reaver. I also, of course, want to give a huge shout out to all of the channel's members as well. You guys are all incredible. If you want to support the channel directly as well, there is the join button on this video, which should direct you towards membership options. Remember, even if you do want to support the channel, always take care of yourselves first before supporting any content creator. And of course, I appreciate your patronage all the same. Finally, what did you think of the Warhammer 2C video and the Mech Within? Or at least the parts you watched. What worked for you? Did you enjoy the Star Adder component? Did you enjoy the Snow Ravens? Let me know in the comment section below, and I will catch you all there. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to take a little bit of a break for a week. <laughs> we'll catch you all with the next content. All right, Red, I'm gonna knock these out for you, and you can edit them however you want. I will not be offended. You're good people. Doctrine and rhetoric cannot win battles, and if considered above experience, will lose the campaign. It is the experience and courage of our warriors, employed by skilled and intrepid commanders decisively and supported by a flexible and hearty logistics chain that will win the campaign. In the absence of one or even two, battles may be won, but the campaign will be lost. Our warriors are experienced and courageous, and our commanders are certainly intrepid, it is in the realm of logistics where we continue to fail. In the process of creating this new society and transforming our military, I feel we have lost the experience we need to support our warriors as they fight this campaign. Khan Absalom Truscott, Personal Journals, 17th April, 28. 17. Editor's note. They knew they sucked at logistics then. Alright, let me let me give that another read, just so it's one line.